We have a duty, those of us who believe in totally peaceful means, to use all our powers of persuasion with the people involved in both camps, and I'm doing that. John Hume was the leading nationalist politician of his generation, a lifelong champion of reconciliation, leader of the SDLP, and the chief architect of the peace process. He was born in 1937 into a partitioned Ireland, a nakedly sectarian state, and a gerrymandered city where the majority Catholic population were downtrodden and second-class citizens. The major fact in my early life as a child was that I grew up in poverty. My father was unemployed. There was widespread discrimination against our people in, in, in the Northern Ireland of those days. Get on the pavement. You, you have a right to be on the pavement. Stand on the pavement. I'm a Catholic. I live and work in Derry. My view is that the division in the population w which exists here must be eradicated. Both sides must work to build the city. I must also bluntly state that Catholics here are faced with blatant social injustice. Hume initially studied for the priesthood in Maynooth, but returned to Derry as a school teacher and an activist in the credit union movement. When the civil rights movement began, he was prominent in leading protests in Derry, which were always unwaveringly peaceful, despite the violent response of the state to such assemblies. Yeah, but we want to march in there. Why not? It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. You can't play. Who's going to the government? Not our government. The people of this area have launched a massive campaign of passive resistance to show that they have withdrawn their consent completely from the system of government that operates in Northern Ireland. Hume was one of the founders of a new peaceful nationalist party the SDLP in 1970. He became its leader in 1979. Along the way, he was elected to the Northern Assembly, to Westminster as the MEP for Foyle, and also to the European Parliament. I believe that we have a real process of lasting peace and a total cessation of violence on the basis that I have just stated. And I'm saying to them, hurry up and deal with it. One of Hume's great skills was in devising inclusive solutions that brought both unionist and nationalist communities together. He was hugely instrumental in drawing up the Sunningdale Agreement in 1974 and the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. He went to extraordinary lengths to seek a peaceful solution to the conflict, including frequent visits to the US, where he forged a powerful axis with Irish-American politicians, particularly Ted Kennedy. I have said repeatedly that I will speak to anyone if I believe that talking to them will make uh, a contribution to peace and stability. During the 1980s, he began a secret dialogue with the Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams that culminated in the 1994 IRA ceasefire and the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. A historic day at Stormont after two years of talks and after a generation of bloodshed and decades of division and acrimony, George Mitchell ushers in what the whole island hopes will be a new era of peace. It's the first time that the people of Ireland, North and South have spoken as to how they share this piece of earth together. The principle of consent is absolute and is throughout the agreement. And the breakthrough is that that is now accepted by all North and South. John Hume was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1998 alongside the Ulster Unionist Party leader David Trimble. His efforts to bring Sinn Féin to the negotiating table ushered in a largely peaceful era but came at an electoral cost to the SDLP which was eclipsed by Sinn Féin in the polls. Hume retired from politics in 2004 at which time he was suffering the early stages of dementia becoming increasingly dependent on his wife Pat. John Hume summed up his life's work in simple words. He said, real division in Ireland is not a line on a map, but in the hearts and minds of people. Former US President Bill Clinton described him as the Irish conflict's Martin Luther King.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Schumann Center at the European University Institute to day two of the Hume Inaugural European Conference 2021 on leadership for peaceful change. Yesterday, our conference powerfully began with Mary McAleese's address and she interrogated both the spirit and the reality and the genius, the political genius of John Hume and his unstinting work as a leader to deliver a better and more peaceful Northern Ireland. We pivot today to look at uh, other areas of the world that are challenged, but I will tell you more about this uh, when, uh, when I finish my remarks. It is a great pleasure for me to now welcome Mo Hume, John's daughter, uh, to offer a family welcome and appreciation and thank you for this conference on behalf both of the uh, John and Pat Hume Foundation and the European University Institute. So Mo, the floor is yours. Hello. My name is Mo Hume, and on behalf of the Hume Foundation, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all to the second day of this virtual conference on the role of the EU as a peacemaker. I would like to offer a personal vote of thanks to Professor Bridget Laffin, whose leadership has put together such an inspiring programme. I would also like to wish Professor Laffin all the very best for her retirement. My father, John Hume, was vocal some might even say repetitive in his admiration for the European project. Not just as a practical framework for social, economic and cultural change, but also as a philosophy that contains the key to conflict resolution. In his words, the European Union was the single most potent symbol of conflict resolution in our history. He was not uncritical of the EU bureaucracy especially when it fell short of upholding its key principles of partnership, equality, tolerance, respect for difference and inclusion. But nonetheless, he was unfailingly inspired by the core idea that we all better working with each other and for each other. In his mind, this very simple, but all too often elusive idea remains or should remain at the heart of peace building. I know in my own work in Latin America that the EU has and continues to provide important support to communities who are engaging in the struggle against violence and towards peace. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the experiences of other regions and other countries in their struggle against violent conflict. Today we'll hear papers on the Balkans, Belarus, Middle East and North Africa. I wish you an excellent debate, an excellent discussion and an excellent conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mo. Much appreciated uh, your, your words for today's conference. As we move from yesterday, where the focus was on the EU as a model of peace making and peacekeeping, today we want to look at Europe's very troubled neighbourhood. And if we think back to the dynamic of European integration, the first gains were the western half of the continent and then following 1989, uh, the eastern half of the continent joined this cooperative framework. But beyond the borders of the existing EU, the EU 27, there are very troubled places and spaces. We begin today with a, uh, with a session moderated by Pat Cox on the role of the EU in the Western Balkans. And the Western Balkans, these small states are European, they are accession states, and the aim is that they will, in the foreseeable, not the unforeseeable future, be member states of the EU. And again, when we look at the collapse of communism in Europe, the one part of Europe that really suffered was the Balkans in the 1990s. So if the Balkans can be rendered stable and prosperous, this is something that is good, not just for the Balkans, but for all of Europe. And then we move to the Eastern neighborhood, to Belarus. 
And Belarus is a country that is now dominated by a dictator, but has this extraordinary desire for democracy, peace and prosperity. And again, it's on Europe's border. Europe, it's unlikely ever to be a member state of the EU, but the EU has an enormous responsibility to those people in Belarus that want a better future for themselves and for their children. And then we then move to perhaps an even more problematic and challenging region, the Middle East and the MENA region in North Africa. And here again, we've seen the Syrian war, the collapse of Libya, basically the hopes of the Arab Spring crushed. And again, we need to think about because there is, Europe is interdependent with the southern shores of the Mediterranean, and we need to think about ways of stabilizing that very unstable uh, part of the world. And finally, today we end with a closing address by uh, Simon Coveney, Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs and Foreign Defence. So I think we can move directly now to the first, uh, to our first session this afternoon, and that's the EU's role of peace building and reconciliation in the Western Balkans. I look forward very much to the presentations, to the discussions, and I, again, on behalf of the European University Institute and the Schumann Center, I thank the John and Pat Hume Foundation for asking us to be part of what has been a remarkable first day, and I'm sure a remarkable second day. So I look forward very much to the discussion, to the papers, to the interventions. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Hume Inaugural European Conference jointly organized by the European University Institute's Robert Schumann Center of Advanced Studies and the John and Pat Hume Foundation. My thanks to both for the invitation to moderate this session titled The EU's Role in Support of Peace Building and Reconciliation in the Western Balkans. I am Pat Cox, a former president of the European Parliament, where I served as a member from 1989 to 2004 overlapping with the last 15 years of John Hume's service of 25 years as a member of that parliament. It is an honour and a pleasure to be associated with this event. Inspired by European integration, John Hume tirelessly preached the message of peace and reconciliation. In Northern Ireland, he steadfastly flew the flag of constitutional politics and of respect for the rule of law over the alternative paramilitary law of the jungle. Hume was inspired by the principles he saw at the heart of the European Union, the same principles he promoted at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. These principles, to quote him from a speech he gave in the European Parliament, are number one, respect for difference. That is what all conflict is about. Difference should be respected. Number two, institutions which respect difference. And number three, working together in the common interest and by doing so, breaking down the barriers of the past. That is the end of the quote. I think all three principles, of course, are relevant to today's topic. And to develop our theme today, we're joined by two very well-placed contributors, Mirislav Leitchak and Heather Grad. Mirislav Leitchak is the EU Special Representative for the belgrade pristina Dialogue and other Western Balkan regional issues. His task is to seek to achieve comprehensive normalization of the relations between Serbia and Kosovo, to improve good neighborly relations and reconciliation between the partners in the Western Balkans helping them to overcome the legacy of the past and contribute to the consistency and effectiveness of EU action in the Western Balkans. Mr. Lajcek is a Slovak diplomat who previously served as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovakia and as President of the UN General Assembly for its 72nd session. He was EU Special Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2007 to 2009 
whilst also acting as the international community's high representative there. As a personal envoy of the EU's high representative, Mr. Lightchak negotiated, organized and supervised a referendum on the independence of Montenegro in 2006 on behalf of the European Union. He also helped shape the new, newly formed diplomatic service of the EU, the European External Action Service, as its managing director for Europe and Central Asia. In addition, he served as the EU's chief negotiator for the association agreements of the EU with Ukraine and Moldova. EU special representatives such as Mr. Lychak promote the EU's policies and interests in certain regions and countries, as well as issues of particular concern or interest for the EU. They play an active role in efforts to consolidate reforms, stability and the rule of law. The first EU special representatives, uh, representative was appointed in 1996. Currently, there are nine such representatives supporting the work of the high representative of the Union, uh, Joseph Borrell. And Mr. Lychak is a graduate of the Moscow State Institute for International Relations and has a Juris Doctor degree from the Comenius University in Bratislava. We're also joined by Heather Grad. Heather is director of the Open Society European Policy Institute, the EU policy arm of the Open Society Foundation. This works to ensure that open society values are at the heart of EU policies and actions, both inside and outside its borders. Heather is a political scientist and an advocate for democratic pluralism and open societies. From 2004 to 2009, she was senior advisor to the then European Commissioner for Enlargement, Oli Rehn, responsible for EU policy on the Balkans and Turkey. Previously, she was deputy director of the Center for European Reform, where she wrote extensively on EU external policies and enlargement. She also conducted academic research at our host university, European Uni University Institute in Florence, at Chatham House, London, Oxford and Birmingham universities, and has taught at the London School of Economics. We'll begin, if I may, by turning to you, Minister Vlajcek, and ask you to take the floor and introduce the topic for us. Thank you very much, Pat, and I want to thank uh, for being invited to this uh, discussion, and uh, I'm very pleased to contribute to it. And uh, our discussion uh, uh, today is about the European Union's role in supporting peace, building, and reconciliation in the Western Balkans, which, as I understand, is part of the wider uh, discussion about the European Union's role in peacemaking and peace building in Europe and neighborhood. So let me start by repeating uh, what may sound obvious, but I think it's uh, important to be aware, namely that the European Union in itself was created as a peace process. Peace is in the European Union's DNA, and it's embedded in everything we do within the European Union and also outside of, of, of it. And everything that we do is based on our values and principles we believe in. Uh, and the, the way European Union promotes peace reconciliation is done directly and also indirectly. Directly is the simple fact that European Union is the world's largest provider of development assistance and humanitarian aid. And of course, European Union is global leader to fight the climate change and to promote uh, global public good. But uh, maybe even more importantly, indirectly, uh, namely that the European Union, despite its imperfections, uh, has been and continues to be a powerful inspiration for many around the world. It's, the, it's this famous soft power that the European Union has been projected that has inspired millions uh, in and outside of the European co continent. And th this is very important, particularly now, because uh, the challenges differ from region to, uh, to region. They differ in scale but they do not differ in nature. And, and especially uh, now, uh, over the last uh, year and a half, uh, when we have all been facing pandemics, it is clear that we share the same planet and we share the same uh, challenges and they, don't, they know no borders. And we are all affected, no matter rich or poor, big or small issues, such as pandemics or uh, poverty or organized crime or migration or terrorism or climate change. They all 
require joint action. And I'm glad that European Union has been a very firm uh, promoter of, 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 of its peaceful ideas and principles. And then, of course, we will be discussing in detail about the, the European Union's roles in the Western Balkans. Here, I want to say that the most powerful peace contribution of the European Union to the Western Balkans is the enlargement policy. Because enlargement means expand, expanding the area of peace, uh, de democracy, uh, economic prosperity, uh, expanding the area of uh, four freedoms, expanding the area where European norms and values apply. So this is a, a huge challenge and the, the European Union of course, sees this as one of its priorities. And then we can also later in the course of our discussion uh, speak, and I'm sure we will, about some concrete examples of, uh, of the European Union uh, intervention in the Western Balkans in the name of peace and reconciliation. And I can mention two examples that I know quite well, uh, the independence referendum of Montenegro, which uh, for me remains uh, uh, to be the best example of the European Union's preventive diplomacy in, in the Western Balkans. And of course, my current task, which is the uh, the, the belgrade pristina dialogue, dialogue on normalization of relations between uh, Kosovo and Serbia. And uh, my last sentence, all these efforts are uh, led by the European Union, not by coincidence, uh, but simply because uh, they are based on the European Union principles, on European Union values, and uh, they are not processes in themselves, but their, 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 their bigger goal is to help the region to overcome its tragic past and to get closer to, to, to its European Union membership perspective. So I'll stop here. And of course, I'm looking forward to engage in greater details to, uh, to these topics. Thank you, Miroslav. So uh, Heather, I turn to you. you. You can take over now. You have the floor for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to start actually with John Hume's fundamental principles, which you mentioned at the very beginning, Pat, because they're very relevant for the Balkans and especially for any um, external uh, actor that wishes to influence the future of the region and, and bring it forward as the European Union does. So first of all, his fundamental principle about respect for differences. This is, of course, at the heart of European integration. Um, the EU's own motto is unity in diversity and uh, the combination of respecting sovereignty while uh, forging common action and having common policies and rules. This is what European integration is all about. Um, in the Balkans, however, there's a really important um, trend which I think is, is worrying, which is um, you can respect differences, but it's not a great idea to exacerbate them. Um, and we've seen over the past couple of decades um, the way that um, the uh, emphasis on having um, joint and, um, and unified uh, approaches to things like education, for example, and use of languages has got, uh, it's, it's been ebbing, the, the chances of, of achieving that have been ebbing. There were attempts um, in the um, early, um, the, 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 the decade um, following uh, the end of the wars um, at things like uh, forging a common history curriculum for the region so that uh, children would be, sought, would be taught an agreed curriculum of what had happened uh, to the region in the past um, that would help them then to move towards uh, a more common view of the future. That kind of idea is really impossible now. It's very difficult to see how you would do that when, for example, uh, children in Bosnia-Herzegovina are being taught different history curricula in the same school, depending on which ethnic group they, are, they, they belong to and, and where they are um, being educated. Um, similarly, languages have got further and further apart. This was a region that, of course, started with at least a common lingua franca from the former Yugoslavia of, um, of, that, that, of Serbo-Croat that uh, pretty well everybody knew. But the differences between languages have got bigger and bigger over time. Now, that's perhaps inevitable. That's something that also happened between the Czech Republic and Slovakia after the, the Velvet Divorce. Uh, this is the nature of, of people to speak their, their own things. But it's really important that politicians don't encourage it and that um, this exacerbation of difference, um, which is a tendency um, often of politicians who wish to rally their own constituencies, rally their own people by increasing the differences between in-groups and out-groups, that this doesn't become sectarianism. And of course, John Hume was extremely aware of this. 
um, and he himself worked a great deal on what is the common future. And that, of course, takes us to the second two principles, um, institutions and working for the common interest. Now, on institutions, I think the EU has done pretty well in um, making an enormous investment over the past two decades in building up institutions and administrative capacity in the region partly in the interests of the accession process itself, because the EU needs to have a competent uh, interlocutor to negotiate with. Um, and of course, there's no way a country can join the EU if its, if its institutions are not capable of handling the, the famous acquis communautaire and um, all of the obligations of EU membership, which are pretty onerous. Um, and the EU has really invested there on um, trying to bring European integration and also regional integration through institutions. In fact, you might argue that the, the region is rather over-institutionalized these days rather than under-institutionalized. Um, but, but of course, John Hume was right that by working together in institutions, meeting regularly, that's how people come together and they find a common future. And that takes me to the last point about John Hume's principle of working for the common interest. The, and, and there, the European Union has been a really important beacon uh, for the region. Sadly, a, a more faded beacon than it used to be because uh, the process is taking so long and has hit so many obstacles. But this common European future that has been referred to for the region in so many council conclusions, it remains um, one of the few really unifying factors. And it's something that is um, still an asset and a very important um, uh, source of hope um, which other regions don't have, for example. And I think that it needs to be used very carefully. And for that reason, it's very important not to allow bilateral disputes, particularly with EU member states, to block um, the, pro the progress of countries who are progressing on the, the agreed criteria. One of the conundrums of a policy at which the EU has, an accession policy which is based on conditionality is, that you've got to maintain the credibility of, those, of the criteria for accession for it to be effective. It's a piece of string that you can only pull on, you can't push on, as John Maynard Keynes said about economic policy. You can only attract countries towards the EU and encourage them to meet the criteria. And that doesn't work if they believe that the very difficult um, uh, reforms they have to make and the progress they have to make towards the EU's conditions can then uh, lead to uh, a seemingly endless blockage uh, because one member state or another uh, wishes to resolve a bilateral issue. Um, and so the, I think that's the, one of the most difficult as aspects now um, in the whole accession process, um, that it's losing its credibility um, with the people, not just the political establishment, but the people in the region uh, because of these blockages. And of course, there are plenty of other reasons why progress has been slow. Um, but that defining the common interest, working for the common interest, needs is a principle that needs to apply also to the EU member states, not only to the countries in the region. And, and I would like to see some solution to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. So let me perhaps pick up the what you've described, Heather, as the asset of an EU perspective. And of course, Miroslav, you're on you're on the front line of trying to to manage that asset in 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 day to day terms. Could I ask you what perspective, when you sit down to talk to leaders in the region, what realistic perspective politically can you offer them? I I know talking about pulling or pushing on a string, um, to, to stick with the analogy, we don't know how long the string is. And they don't know how long it is. And while there are indeed EU bilateral disputes that have spilled over into the region, there has been over some time in some political circles in the EU, a certain fatigue, even ennui with enlargement. And among a lot of people, an anxiety about finalité politique. Where, not where does it begin? We're all happy it began with peace and reconciliation, but where, where does it end some way? And I think the counterpart, as you, you, you must experience it in Western Balkans, a fatigue of nearly being there lots of the time, but never quite. So could, could you deal with that kind of dual fatigueism? on both sides to do with endless process, but not necessarily the achievement of the high objective. 
Yes, indeed, this is a, a, a big uh, issue that we uh, are facing right now and, and it does not make our life uh, easier. I remember very well the times when my country, Slovakia, was aspiring to, to join the European Union and uh, I, I was part of this process and it was extremely important for us that we knew what the rules are uh, and what the target is and what the conditions are to get to, to that target. And this was... Uh, extremely motivating in, in uh, undergoing all these painful and almost unthinkable of reforms. But we knew that uh, uh, what, what it delivers uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of the benefits of the result, that, that means the membership. Uh, the situation, and we also made it very clear, I mean, we speaking about the countries uh, of Central Europe that uh, the joining the European Union is our main priority and we, need to demonstrate it in everything we do in every day. So it's not that you have a process uh, where you discuss technicalities, but then uh, you live your uh, separate life outside of this process, because everything that you do must be really measured by whether or not it's bringing you closer to the European Union. <clears throat> and this made the European Union's influence over our internal processes extremely uh, strong, extremely strong. Uh, unfortunately, uh, over the years, uh, the, the situation has uh, changed. We have divided the criteria for the EU membership into sub-criteria. Uh, that means the same process. Uh, now uh, we will like build, build additional steps to get to the same target. One example, uh, you know, some years back, uh, uh, getting the candidate status aut automatically meant uh, starting the accession negotiations. Right now, it's one stage to get the candidate status. Then it's the next step to get the agreement to start the accession negotiations. And it's, it's a, a separate issue to actually start the accession negotiations as we have seen recently in, in, uh, in our regions. Uh, it, has also, uh, it is also clear that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, somehow the technical part of the EU accession process has uh, prevailed over the political part uh, as if, uh, it was not clear that the, uh, the enlargement of the process is a profoundly political process, which is based on technical criteria. Uh, but the technical, technical criteria must, must not prevail over the political ones. And again, the political criteria is about how the country demonstrates their adherence to the European Union uh, values, norms, and rules. And one of the, of course, the most powerful indicators is alignment with the European Union uh, common foreign security policy views and standards, because this is a, uh, the, the, the very clear, clear indicator where you stand on these issues. Uh, so we, we've somehow, uh, uh, European Union, and I can understand why. I mean, we have been facing uh, many uh, challenges that uh, came unexpected, basically starting with 2008, 2009, with, uh, uh, with the financial crisis, with the change of the global uh, geopolitical landscape. We uh, we had to deal with the uh, with the migration crisis. We had to adjust uh, somehow and and uh, and uh, uh, reassess the, the the way we act uh, during the four years of, of President Trump in the White House. Uh, we have now, of course, the pandemics, and obviously the e European Union uh, leaders, governments are expected from from their citizens to take care of these issues, and of course to take care of their well-being. So this puts uh, objectively the issue of en enlargement uh, uh, more to the back, but uh, we must not make a mistake of uh, sending mixed signals to the region uh, or appearing as if we uh, do not consider enlargement uh, as important as uh, it was the case five, 10 years ago. Uh, we must also avoid creating an Im Im impression that all the conditions we are putting uh, are actually meant not to make their membership possible, but on the contrary, to, to let them wait forever. Because uh, this is, of course, uh, they are losing their enthusiasm uh, and we are losing our credibility. So uh, I, I would also say, and th this is the, uh, in, a, in a way uh, the situation we are in right now, because when you look at the, at the last year, last year was not a good year for, uh, for the enlargement and subsequently for the European Union's uh, authority and credibility in the Western Balkans. Uh, 
the two countries that are negotiating the membership, uh, Montenegro and Serbia, did not make uh, any progress in the last two years. I mean, Serbia did not open a single chapter. Uh, Montenegro did not close any chapter. Uh, Albania and North Macedonia are waiting to start their accession, actual accession negotiations after uh, the European Council last year in March already decided that they should uh, open the accession negotiations. Uh, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina are dreaming about getting uh, the candidate status so that it can, they can start thinking about the accession negotiation. And on top of it, of course, uh, Kosovo feels very much hurt by the fact that the, uh, its citizens cannot en enjoy the visa-free uh, regime, which has been become a, 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 a common reality all over the European continent. So uh, as a consequence, as I said, the enthusiasm in the region is uh, decreasing. Uh, European uh, forces or people who sincerely believe in the, in the European future are, uh, are uh, uh, I mean, dis disheartened or discouraged. And this opens the space for those who believe in other alternatives, other options. So I'm very, uh, very clear and I'm absolutely convinced that no other country, no other uh, power can offer what the European Union is offering to the region. But at the same time, it is extremely important for us uh, to, to make sure that our offer is credible. It's not seen as blurred. We are not seen as, as moving the, the goalposts. And uh, we had a very good discussion at the level of European Union foreign ministers in May, where everybody acknowledged that we need to do better. We need to be more credible. We need to change the way we communicate with our partners. We need to make enlargement more uh, tangible and more visible. And now it's really important to, to, to move from these words into concrete actions, because looking at the big picture, I, not only that I do not see better uh, alternative, better future for the region other than the European future, I also do not see better uh, alternative for us, for the European Union, better than to have the Western Balkans as part of our family, sharing our, our values, our norms, and also being part of our four freedoms. We just need to uh, reconfirm this, this one more time, and uh, we don't need to invent what has been already invented. We just have to apply to our own rules, both our partners and ourselves. Thank you for that. Uh, Heather, uh, it's, it wasn't the same thing, but rather than just repeat the, 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 the fatigue uh, question, you, you talked about the, that Hume philosophy of addressing differences and trying to find consensual ways forward. But you mentioned the other important word about differences, which is exploiting and exacerbating difference. So I, I would like, in turning to you, to take the exacerbation question. The raw material is lying around for various people to exploit. And I'd like you to bring us a bit into the geopolitics. Maroslav has already mentioned, without developing the team, but we, we know the context of what I might call Trumpist unilateralism to, to, to do with some, some work uh, in, in the White House. But now Joe Biden is back, there should, there should be a, a better US-EU cooperation. But I'm thinking more of the engagement of Russia in exacerbating what's already there, the role of China to do with infrastructure development, the role of Turkey to do with some traditional post-Ottoman connections, the role of the Gulf states to do with religious orthodoxies and so on. So th there's a lot in there. Um, could you unpack some of that for us to do with geopolitics and the challenges in the context of what Miroslav has just said? Yes, and it's very interesting looking at it today because the Balkans has for centuries been um, a, a battleground of different influences. Um, that's, that's very long been the case. Um, partly the uh, ethnic makeup of the region is because of deliberate policies under the Ottoman Empire uh, to bring uh, populations um, uh, to be mixed in different areas in order to maintain a tension that allowed them to maintain control. So the, the, the region, it, this didn't all start um, when um, the EU accession prospect um, mm. opened up um, in, in 2003 uh, for the region. This, this has been going on for centuries. Um, but the question is, as you say, um, how far this, these differences um, can be uh, 
channeled into respect and then looking at the common future and how much they're exacerbated both by domestic politicians and also by um, external powers. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic has not improved the situation. Mm. If we think working backwards, I think the most the, the the most recent example of where this has happened has been about vaccines, where uh, the EU has in fact given a lot of vaccines to the region, but slowly. Uh, it took time, and in that in that interval when there were no vaccines available from the EU, uh, Balkan countries turned to China and Russia mm. uh, to get their their jabs, and there were there was huge publicity for the first planes arriving with vaccines from Russia and from China um, and great celebration that these countries had provided what the EU had not. And the EU really missed a, an important opportunity uh, to show uh, that, it's, that it's support for the region, which is unquestionably, it, the EU has invested so much more money mm. than anybody else um, in the region. But um, it's, it's those critical moments that are, where people see on the television screens the things that they're really, they really want, they really need, like vaccines, um, who supplies them at that critical moment is, of course, going to make an enormous difference. So it's, it's a real pity to see what's happened this spring, uh, where the first EU-funded COVID vaccines only arrived in May after the Chinese and, and Russian, you know, there had already been this, this appeal in, in February. Um, but I think to come back also to this, this question of, of difference and, and what to do um, uh, in terms of the accession process, um, Miroslav put his finger on something very important, which is the accession process um, relies on the idea of positive competition between countries, relies on the idea that countries compete in order to move forward, um, but, you know, in the end, they will all join, um, but uh, they all have an opportunity to move forward based on these technical criteria that he was pointing out need to be credible and consistent and coherent and so on. And we've had the problem of the, the whole process becoming very politicized. But there's then a further dimension to that, which is the signals that the EU sends about democracy in the region, because it's quite hard to have technical criteria on democracy. And although the EU has tried to spell out its political conditions, what does stability of democracy and institutions um, actually mean, which is the official condition for joining the EU. Um, in practice, the EU has very often uh, favored status quoism, you could call it that, or you could call it um, stabilitocracy, um, just trying to maintain stability even if a leader has come to a power who is doing things that are clearly wouldn't be um, accepted as democratic practice or good governance in the European Union itself. And this has happened in a number of countries where the EU has ended up saying, OK, we're going to turn a blind eye to all of these electoral irregularities. We're going to support this leader, even though we can see that he is engaging in corruption, including the use of EU funds, and uh, and indeed uh, engaging in anti-democratic practices like controlling the press, um, like repressing um, opponents, um, and so on, um, just in order to maintain, to keep the peace. You know, the kind of sense that as long as nobody's shooting, the situation is, is acceptable. But it's not really acceptable, because that country then is going to have enormous difficulty as an EU member state, and indeed cause problems for the European Union, if governance is then corrupted and if it's very difficult and if that has then exacerbated ethnic dif um, differences and tensions within that country. So it's, it's buying short-term stability at the cost of long-term stability, which is ultimately in the EU's best interests. And at the same time, the EU has really done very little to, um, to slow the flow of really vile anti-Western, pro-Russian and pro Turkish and Gulf, or whatever, but basically anti-EU um, and indeed anti-US uh, campaigns, um, some of which have actually been run by governments in the region who have, you know, speak, pretending to be pro-Western abroad, but leading anti-Western campaigns at home and basically spreading disinformation about the European Union. Um, and, you know, if you look at the impact that that's had, it's quite extraordinary. In 2009, which is when um, Serbians gained um, liberalization of visas so that they could come freely into the EU, which was a really major and significant achievement, about 70% of the population was in favor of EU membership. Whereas um, now in recent polls, it's been at 50% and often less, even though, where is the other perspective? What really is the alternative to EU membership for, for Serbians' futures? 
and, and among young people, this is even greater, across the whole region, um, 18 to 29 year olds are more anti-EU, more radical right um, encouraged, and more prone to believe conspiracy theories than the older generation, than the 30 to 44 year olds. They're less liberal, they're less pro-democracy, um, they they, they're less sold into European values. Now, that shows a very fundamental political change in the region. And the EU should not be trying to uh, control politics in the region. I think the problem has been actually too little EU engagement in democracy, and particularly the storylines that dominate political debates, rather than too much involved. The EU has tried to maintain these criteria. That's been a good thing, but really hasn't fought against the disinformation, um, nor really taken to task leaders who are out of one side of their mouth saying to the EU, we want to join, let us in as soon as possible. On the other side, of their mouth saying to the population, look at how useless Brussels is, let's go to Moscow, let's go to Beijing for what we need. So it's a complex mix. I don't want to point the finger only at politicians in the region because I think the EU has also uh, failed to, 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 to take opportunities um, and failed to act when that was necessary. But it's a very serious problem. And of course, uh, there's also then this, the longer term impact that people are voting with their feet. Young people are leaving the region. And of course, they're going to the European Union. They're going to the labor hungry parts of Europe like Germany um, and getting work permits. And good for them that they're making a better life for their families and so on. Um, and, and that they're providing that labor. And, you know, I, I fully support visa liberalization and offering work permits. And that has massively decreased the tension also that was created by socioeconomic deprivation in the region. But it means that the region is being evacuated, particularly by the young. And this emigration um, is and now labor shortages and essentially complete loss of, of many young people in the region. This is huge and it's an enormous issue that will be there for decades to come. Thank you for that. That, that brings me, uh, Miroslav, if, if I could, because I, I, I want to, to kind of bring you in on this team, but to, to make an observation, which I suppose reveals my own vintage. Um, I, I had the privilege to uh, attend for the European Parliament at EU summit meetings in the course of my mandate. And one of those closed a Greek presidency of the EU. This is before the Lisbon Treaty and a permanent council president led by Prime Minister Simitis and Foreign Minister Papandreou at Thessaloniki in 2003. And there, not surprisingly, because Greece is in the region, they wanted to animate the EU's engagement or reanimate the engagement which had been spoken of but not greatly acted upon. And I fully accept that you've touched earlier on some of the achievements of EU preventative diplomacy in the region, and, and, the, and these are real and solid achievements. If I put a bracket around those, the thing I would say, looking back to Thessaloniki, I had the privilege afterwards to go and speak to all the parliaments in the region. I invited all of their speakers to join us when we met with COSAC speakers from the EU member states to come as observers. I got several of their presidents who were willing to do so to come and make plenary addresses to the European Parliament. And that was my parliamentary pledge to do with politics, not to do with technicalities. And to be honest with you, my sense, with the passage of time and 18 years later, how little has changed and how much the technocracy rules over the democracy, how little there is of that day-to-day -day engagement. And then if you add in the, the point made by Heather about people who vote with their feet, of course, something we saw throughout Central Eastern Europe as well when, when, when accession happened. Um, the region really is kind of stuck in a not very great space to do with economy, to do with migration, to do with the growth of populism. Uh, you mentioned, Miroslav, the need to align foreign policy, which would be you know, a great benefit for both parties through enlargement. But we have this prospect of joint military exercises between the Slavic brothers in, in, in Belarus, uh, Russia and Serbia, it's hardly an encouraging smoke signal uh, to send out if you're, if you're looking uh, to put out uh, diplomatic and political fires. Yes. <laughs> what, can I, what can I say? I, I agree with, uh, of course, with uh, your observations. I very much agree with Heather uh, and, and her points. I mean, 
first of all, vaccines, it was a missed opportunity for the European Union. Our partners are so much used that your EU is uh, by their side uh, when, whenever they need uh, our assistance, uh, apart from the millions of euros that are pouring into the region, uh, almost un, uh, I would say uh, un, unnoticed mm. and certainly uh, underappreciated because they are taken for granted, but the, the vaccination was something very, very visible. And uh, yes, we could not act quickly enough. And uh, it, it really uh, generated a lot of uh, criticism and, and, and a bad, uh, a bitter uh, atmosphere. Uh, and I also, uh, I mean, very, very well respect the fact that, uh, yes, that there are trends and tendencies uh, in the region, in, in, in uh, individual countries that, uh, do not send the message of the full adherence to European values and norms. And we do not, I'm very often asked by people uh, why European Union does not undertake uh, repressive measures. But this is the whole uh, irony uh, and the philosophy of the enlargement process that there has never been a need for repression because it, uh, it assumes that you are committed and that you don't need to be, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you don't need to be punished uh, and, and the only punishment is uh, to slow down or to even uh, suspend your accession process. And this would be the, the, the harshest punishment uh, for anyone who is uh, sincerely committed to, to the enlargement and to the future membership. But right now, uh, the process has slowed down anyway. And uh, as you say, uh, techno technocracy prevails over, over democracy. The way I see it, yes. But I also see this that uh, as a as an excuse from our side to buy time. So it's not that we have changed the strategy, but we right now uh, see other priorities. We have never said, and there is, uh, there is no government that has said uh, we uh, want to enlargement to stop. But what they do say is that let us uh, deal with the urgent issues of the internal functioning uh, of the issues that affect the, the existence of the European Union and uh, let's deal with, uh, let's keep the process of enlargement going. But yes, we have uh, uh, slowed this process down and therefore we have also uh, put, like uh, we are prom putting the, the technical criteria before the political criteria, uh, which uh, also cre uh, creates a wrong impression in the region as if uh, uh, the enlargement process, accession process is a technical process. And I said, it's profoundly political based on meeting the technical criteria. But it's not technical, and we must really avoid this false dilemma between technical and political. And uh, Thessaloniki is a is a great uh, point of reference, and this is when the European Union very clearly, uh, unambiguously declared that uh, the future of the Western Balkans is in the European Union. But I am sure that uh, no one from those uh, who were uh, in Thessaloniki uh, in two thousand three. Uh, starting with you, uh, Pat, would uh, at that time believe that 18 years later only one uh, of okay. the Western Balkans would make it, would become a full member, and we will see this uh, stage of the EU accession process that I, I mentioned a while, while before. So, uh, yes, this is a, it's like, like riding a bicycle. We must not stop because mm -hmm. we fall down. So we really need to... Uh, uh, to bring back the credibility of the process so that also uh, the tools that we have, not the tools of repression, but tools of, uh, for example, slowing down the process will be, uh, will be seen and felt as painful. Uh, because right now they are not. The countries might be thinking uh, uh, if it's not the time for them to look for other options. If, it's, uh, if, it, if they really should put all uh, their credibility uh, uh, into the one direction, which is the European Union membership. And, uh, and one can understand why, uh, particularly when uh, looking at North Macedonia. So we, we really, uh, mm. uh, I mean, I, of course, I, I am confronted a lot with, uh, uh, with the questions about the role of the third actors and the influence of the third. Act. Yes, it is increasing, but why? Because our credibility is decreasing because we are creating a void. We are creating confusion. Uh, and, and that's why we are creating space for our partners to look into other options. And, you know, a few weeks back, there, there was a heated discussion about different non-papers uh, mm. that were circulated and uh, suggesting alternative ways of uh, 
uh, for the Western Balkans, and of course, uh, including extremely dangerous, such as, uh, as uh, the re redrawing of borders. Uh, and again, uh, we, we rightly rejected these ideas because they are very dangerous and they could really bring us easily back to the 90s and to the period of, of violent conflicts. But why they uh, appear? Because, again, be, because people feel the need to look for alternatives. And it is in our hands to make sure that they do not have this need. They do not have to look to China or to Russia. They do not have to, to think about other ways. They, they must believe that the European uh, way, European future is the future which is re realistic and credible. And we also need to, uh, to give a boost to the, those who believe in the European Union because also the way we, we communicate is very technocratic mm -hmm. and also very mentoring. I mean, all I mean, most of what our partners hear from us is about chapters, now about clusters, and about need to uh, fight against corruption, promote rule of law, and, and chapters 23 and 24. So we really need to ask about their opinion. We need to make them uh, part of our discussions about other issues. It we should really uh, uh, avoid as much as possible this uh, you know teacher pupil attitude mm -hmm. that uh, is clearly there. And we have a good opportunity to do, to do so uh, exactly at this time, which is the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, and uh, I am uh, encouraged that, that the Western Balkans will be taking part in this conference. And I really think that this should be a, 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 a turning point so that we uh, less teach and more ask, that we talk to uh, the people, to citizens in the, in the region, we ask about what they think about the future of the European Union. And most importantly, we send a very strong signal that they are the future of the European Union. So I, 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 I really believe that we have to use this opportunity, which really cost us very little, but will have a very, a very big impact, a very big positive impact in the region. I'm, I'm conscious of the time with a few minutes and the fact that we could spend much longer than one hour talking about this. Could I ask you, Miroslav, before I return to Heather, on one concrete issue? Uh, you, of course, are spending a lot of time on the Serbia-Kosovo issue. And talks, I understand, are expected uh, on that uh, front. Uh, now, I know there's some, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister uh, Kurti in, in, in Kosovo now has a very strong political mandate. And at least from, from my remove, I follow this now in the media, not with the intimacy that you do. I see that he's put out, you know, a very strong Kosovar position. He wants full recognition of Kosovo. This is not a surprise. He also says he wants war reparations from Serbia. He says what happened in Kosovo and the Serbian part was genocide, and he wants to file a lawsuit against Belgrade. When I'm reading all of that and reading that you're thinking of opening talks, I'm figuring that the mountain you have to climb is not the Alps, but Everest, looking at what's being added on uh, by this new, uh, very uh, well-mandated uh, Prime Minister in Kosovo. Look, what is most important here is that the dialogue has proved to be uh, a very, uh, I'd say, powerful instrument of, uh, of, uh, of peace and stability in the region. The dialogue has produced number of very concrete agreements that have a positive impact on the life of people. And wh uh, whether we speak about the, of course, the ability of Kosovo to collect the taxes uh, and, and to control their, their borders and boundary, boundary lines, uh, which was not the case before. Of course, the integration of the judiciary and police in the north into the Kosovo constitutional system. Of course, uh, the agreement on uh, on uh, the Kosovo's representation in regional fora, uh, visible uh, agreement of on energy, uh, uh, the, the international uh, dial code, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. These are all the things that were only produced uh, uh, thanks to the dialogue. It is a work in, in progress. There are there is still a long way to go, but the dialogue has really helped to calm down, uh, you know, the tensions in in the region. Uh, the first meetings in the dialogue in the 2011 were a big news, and you know the, the the parties were dealing with the questions whether they should take picture or not, whether they can uh, shake hands or not. 
this has become absolutely irrelevant later on down the road and they were focusing on on concrete issues now we have a new uh, government in kosovo a new prime minister uh, who, who as you said has a very powerful mandate that means he can he can deliver on what he agrees to uh, which was uh, not the case with the previous government uh, but it's also normal uh, for for him to come and to make his own proposals about how to adjust the, how to take the process forward and this is exactly where we are right now so we had uh, fir the, the first meeting between prime minister kurti and president vucic and uh, what i took uh, uh, from it for me and for uh, for the european union is that they both confirmed that they want to normalize the relations they want to continue the dialogue they want to uh, use the eu facilitated process as the right platform for this and we will continue uh, discussing uh, concrete issues and concrete agenda but dialogue has no alternative and the normalization of uh, relations between kosovo and serbia has no alternative uh, and it's uh, important not only for the two parties directly participating but but also for the entire region and let me also add for us for the european union because uh, we aspire to be a global player so uh, this is the opportunity for us to demonstrate that we can uh, project our values and our norms in our immediate neighborhood, such as the Western Balkans. Thank you. Uh, Heather, I, I want to come to you and for forgive that. I wanted to go from the general to the particular with Miroslav to, to understand a bit of what's happening right now in Kosovo, Serbia. I'd like to turn really to the closing team in the, the few minutes we've left. I read a fascinating uh, study, I think it was dated 2018, and it looked at some scenarios, which are always interesting, at least, to speculate what might happen. And it had three scenarios for Western Balkans by 2025. And perhaps to take the full package is a bit too much, but even some of the Western Balkans, one was called the hour of Europe, the optimistic vision that by 2025, people will not be knocking at the door, but some of them will be in and others will see that the door truly is open. The second scenario was the Balkans in limbo. So we can figure what that one is, that we're more or less going around in a circle of a, a combination of mutual engagement and mutual distrust. And the, the third one is one that slips back, the haunting of the ghosts of the past, reasserting themselves in uh, populist politics and so on. Looking at those scenarios and putting some kind of a time scale, which I leave to yourself, what, what, what is your sense you, you know the region well over a long period. Okay. Um, we know all of the complex elements inside and outside that play on it. We know the strengths and weaknesses the EU has brought. But in the end, if you distill it out, what do you think is going to happen in terms of scenario and timeline? Well, unfortunately, all three of those are likely scenarios. I would have said even just a few years ago that the third scenario um, you said of the ghost of the past was uh, was pretty difficult to to imagine these days. Um, but even with the Americans coming back in, you know, the the basically all of the um, external benevolent influences have waned um, in the region. But I think there's a really key and important new uh, variable in all of this um, that Miroslav mentioned right at the very beginning of our discussion um, this afternoon, which we should come back to. And that's how uh, the climate agenda and climate action might lead to uh, a much greater integration of the region practically into the European economy and also tackle some of the major problems in the region. So, uh, as you know, the EU has the European Green Deal. Um, and if it's able successfully to uh, integrate uh, the Balkans into the Green Deal and achieve decarbonization in the region by uh, taking down coal production, which at the moment is still expanding. I mean, Serbia is seeking funding to expand district heating um, using new coal production, for example. If, if the EU were able to reverse that um, and also to provide new opportunities uh, for small businesses to be built, especially by marginalized groups like the Roma, for example, to provide smooth fuel to small businesses and homes um, from renewable sources, if, for example, uh, there can be opportunities for um, also people to be employed in uh, the new uh, industries that will, will be built up, the, the new parts of the economy um, as the secular economy comes to the region, as um, all of the EU's aims for, um, for, for moving to a very different economic model. This is an opportunity for a new impetus between 
uh, EU Balkan co collaboration. Um, it's it's a, an opportunity to wean the region off a dependence on often Russian gas as well as on on domestically produced coal um, and an opportunity to restructure the economy in ways that would provide opportunities for all those young people who are currently leaving the countries um, to stay and and to to move into this this new economic paradigm that's coming so i think this is a key moment to grasp that opportunity um, and to focus people on what um, a low carbon society might be like and, and how to work in a low carbon economy um, to focus the EU investment, which is absolutely enormous, but at the moment is still very much controlled by central governments. So, for example, to, to provide that more to cities that want to introduce electric buses and uh, uh, produce uh, their own renewable energy, for example. So that would also allow more democratization by providing more decentralization and um, opportunities for citizen engagement. So there, there are a number of different ways in which this could break some of these really nasty dynamics that have set in in the region over the past uh, decade and a half. Um, and I think that's something the EU could really focus on because the EU has a really serious agenda with serious investment behind it. And so now it needs to unite that with the now, sadly, very lackluster accession process. It's not a really about, um, the, one of the cliches about the in the process is, it's not about uh, the destination, it's about the journey. It's not about <laughs> when you arrive in the European <laughs> Union, but it's about all of the reforms you achieve along the way. Yeah. And as Miroslav was pointing out earlier, that once you've heard that 100,000 times over 20 years, it doesn't really have any effect anymore. But if mm. you can prove um, that actually this destination is the, the uh, a low carbon Europe um, that has many more opportunities for people in the Balkans, then that it will really be worth um, the, the EU and the, the region journeying together uh, along the, the, the climate transition pathway. Heather, thank you for that. So you're opting for the Green Deal as the, the, the pathway to the destination of Euro optimism in the menu that I mentioned. That Euro optimism, limbo, the ghosts of the past, those scenarios, all of which, of course, could, could play out. What is your sense, Miroslav, of what may emerge? And this thesis about Green Deal and leveraging it, which you know makes, makes a lot of sense, has, of course, one embedded uh, player uh, among many, uh, Gazprom. And they went in and others went in from the Russian orbit when Western business wouldn't touch the post Soviet-style economy that was left behind after the breakup of former Yugoslavia. So they are in there on the ground as established players, um, irrespective almost of direct Kremlin policy. There's all this other commercial dimension uh, which, which plays in this. So I leave the last word with you, uh, Miroslav. I think in the job you're in, uh, like so many people in Europe uh, before you, you have to be a prisoner of optimism or you couldn't go to work every day, uh, despite what you may have to deal with in, in substance. So over to you, Miroslav, for a, a closing remark. Exactly. I have to be optimist, but I, I, I also must be optimist because I, I would not be able to do my, my work, current job, but also I would lose my faith in the European Union. Uh, I, I really don't want the European Union to fail in the Western Balkans because that means we have failed as a global policy actor. And, uh, you know, we have been really hoping to get President Biden and we did get President Biden and his administration. He, he brought people who trust the European Union. I mean, he paid his first uh, visit to the European Union, uh, which is a, a very powerful signal. They support the European Union policies in the Western Balkans, they are ready to support EU lead in, in the Western Balkans. We need to demonstrate this lead. So it's, it's, it would be a mistake to, uh, to see the EU Western Balkan policy as something that comes from us to them. It's something we are doing for them. We are doing it. This is an in investment, investment in our, our security, uh, political stability, also economic prosperity. Uh, and I, I really uh, wish uh, this bigger picture to become a common feature all over the European capitals. Uh, uh, and second, and uh, here I would uh, basically also continue in what Heather just uh, was referring to. As part of this new approach, we need to uh, talk to the, our partners in the Western Balkans beyond enlargement. So it, we, we need to discuss our issues. We need to, 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 to make them part of our discussions about our future, about the Green Deal about the digital economy, about, about the five, 5Gs, 
so that they become part of our system and they will be part of our discussions on so many other issues. We really need to break this, these limitations of discussing enlargement with them and then they are uh, doing their other things and we are doing our other things. So I, I think this uh, partnership atmosphere will really change uh, the way things are being done right now. They will believe in us more, they will become um, more involved, uh, more interested, and we will uh, trust them more and we'll we get used to have them around more. And I think this is the, 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 the right, way, right way forward. Look, thank, thank you, thank you both very much. I'm not going to attempt to do any grand summary. It's not, not my role today, but just re reflecting as I did earlier about my own active uh, years in politics, I was very struck when I was in the European Parliament and when the former Yugoslavia began to collapse in, in civil war um, and ethnic cleansing. I was very struck by the impotence of the European Union at the time. I myself became somewhat cynical about constantly passing resolutions without having the resolve and the capacity to act. And in some ways that has improved, in other ways it remains to improve. And I started to do a lot of reading to try to understand what was going on. And uh, I guess what I realized most of all that one of the terms that came at the time, that this was a fracture zone. It was the edge of many empires, and it has hundreds of years of history at the edge of empire. So that fracture. It has the religious dividing lines where several great religions meet cheek by jowl in a region where sometimes there have been tensions and other times not. And of course, it's a geological fracture zone, as we know, to do with the, the risk of earthquakes and so on. And I read all of this and I read all of the reports that came. And in the end, the thing that gave me the best understanding was reading literature and some of the works of Ivo Andrich. And what shocked me in a book that I read for the first time myself in, in 1998 was a book finished by Andrich in 1948, where he finished with a hypothesis that there were hurricanes of hatred awaiting their hour of expression. Mm. And it was prophetic. I was witnessing these hurricanes blowing at that time. And so when you have these deep layers of history, everything is possible. And I think because no one really wants to step back to the ghosts of the past, there is an especial duty on political Europe to get its head together and to get its act together and to give a political commitment not to use the technocracy as a blocking mechanism, but as an accelerator of change. And if it doesn't have the political overlay, it can't happen. And I know it because that was my experience with the Big Bang enlargement. That whole debate has lots of parallels. There were lots of comfort zones in Western Europe that didn't want it. And I remember of the three pillars when I became president of the parliament, pillar number one was what I called the reunification of Europe, somewhat grandly, but the enlargement process. And it needed an absolute determined political conviction, doing what Miroslav, what you said, politicians talking to other politicians, breaking down the, the mutual incomprehension and misunderstandings and avoidable misunderstandings where it can happen. And if it doesn't happen, pushing it onto the shoulders of someone like you, capable as you are, deprives you of the context in which the seeds that you're planting can truly grow. And so that would be my hope at the end of this, to draw that lesson from John Hume, never to give up on the vision and principles, but to understand that political determination matters. Jean Monnet asked, was he an optimist or a pessimist? Said, je ne suis pas optimiste, je ne suis pas pessimiste, je suis déterminé. I am determined. And I think it is that message that needs to become a political engagement of the European Union if the ghosts of the past should be buried in the past and not come back to haunt the present. Thank you both very much for your wonderful engagement today. Much appreciated and goodbye.
Thank you very much and goodbye. John Hume was born in 1937 in the impoverished and heavily gerrymandered city of Derry. The majority Catholic community was disenfranchised and systematically denied fair housing and other rights. Having studied for the priesthood, John became a teacher and a change maker. He was a prominent leader of the non-violent civil rights movement, inspired by the example of Martin Luther King and John Lewis. Hume's approach remained steadfastly peaceful despite the violence from others, including the state. In the 1970s, John co-founded and then led the SDLP, a peaceful nationalist party in Northern Ireland. But he always advocated partnership between parties. He was elected to the European Parliament, to the UK Parliament and to Northern Ireland Assemblies. John Hume was a tireless and fearless champion of peace and reconciliation. His embrace of diversity, that the basis of peace is equal rights and bringing everyone into the process, echoes loudly amidst the struggles toward acceptance and tolerance that we face today. The essence of unity is the acceptance of diversity. Mm. And if you actually look across the world at every stable democratic society, they, if you look at why they're stable, and why they're united. It's precisely because they accept their diversity. And it's precisely because the institutions of their state reflect the diversity of the people who live in it. His determined advocacy led to powerful partnerships with senior American politicians, several of whom would form the Friends of Ireland in 1981. This new US influence leveraged the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985 which carried Hume's thinking. In the 1980s, John also began a dialogue with Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams. This shaped core principles of the pivotal Downing Street Declaration in December 1993, touching on self-determination, consent and democratic agreement for all people on the island of Ireland. The IRA and Loyalist ceasefires then came in 1994. In the following years, the talks, including all parties and both governments, as John had long advocated, produced the historic Good Friday Agreement in 1998. I would like to introduce you to two men who are making history. Later that year, John Hume was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace, alongside Unionist leader David Trimble. In announcing the award, the Nobel Committee stated that John Hume has throughout been the clearest and most consistent of Northern Ireland's political leaders in his work for a peaceful solution. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Conor O'Cleary. I'm delighted to be chairing this session of the John Hume inaugural European Conference on Leadership for Peaceful Change. By profession, I'm a writer and a former foreign correspondent for the Irish Times. I knew John Hume well and reported on his role in Belfast, London and Washington in bringing an end to the conflict in Ireland. And I would like to think that he would be an inspiration to people in Europe where conflicts remain unresolved. So I'm very happy to be associated with this inaugural conference. Also, I was based in Moscow in the tumultuous years preceding the fall of the Soviet Union, during which time I visited every Soviet Republic, including Belarus, as they strove to achieve independence. So it is not just an honor for me, but it is of great personal interest to find myself in conversation with someone who is at the heart of leadership for peaceful change in Belarus, 30 years after it became independent from the Soviet Union. I'd like to introduce you to Franak Viachorka. Hello, Franak. Uh, Franak has been a lifelong activist for democracy in Belarus and was often imprisoned and arrested and imprisoned in his youth. Based now in Vilnius in Lithuania, he is senior advisor to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, leader of the Democratic Belarus movement and undoubtedly the winner of last year's stolen presidential election. He is now a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Centre and has served as creative director 
for the Middle Rear Service of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He's also Vice President for the Digital Communications Network, Consultant for Freedom House and for the US Agency for Global Media, among many other roles. Today, he is a frequent speaker for democracy and personal freedoms, and he's won several human rights awards, including the prestigious Baselak Havel Fellowship. Among his many achievements, he has also has been editor in chief of the travel book, Wanderer's Guide for Belarusians. Uh, welcome, Franek. Unfortunately, many Belarusians today are obliged, like yourself, to wander far abroad because of the repressive regime at home. Before we get on to substantive issues, I think the conference participants would like to know a bit more about you personally and your life experiences. For example, what was it like growing up in Belarus? And what was it like being a student activist? And what inspired you to become active in the pro-democracy movement? And I would uh, I'd note that you featured in a democracy, in a do documentary about your life as an 18-year-old pro-democracy activist. So I know you've been engaged since a very young age. And perhaps you might also recall for us the rather Kafkaesque experience of how you were expelled from university. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me and speaking about Belarus. You know, I was I was born just uh, two years before Soviet Union collapsed. And um, uh, actually, I was observing uh, how dictatorship of Lukashenko was developing. I remember my father took me to the first the presidential elections. I didn't, uh, did not understand much in politics back then. But uh, actually, it was one month before I started my classes in, in, in school when Lukashenko became the president. And um, uh, neither I nor my friends never saw other presidents, other political leaders in the country, except for except uh, Alexander Lukashenko. For 27 years, he is in power. And all my life was connected somehow with the fight, with the resistance, with the underground movement uh, fighting for democracy and freedom. And it's very difficult because uh, sometimes we were trying to distribute leaflets and newspapers so I got to jail uh, first for 15 days, next time longer. When I was 20, they put me, instead of jail, they take me to the military unit and I spent um, a year and a half in the military unit on the border with Ukraine. It was isolated uh, place in the Chernobyl zone with no connection with outside world, with no letters, with no phones. And they were uh, teaching us how to fight NATO, how to uh, hate the West, um, and uh, this this is experience I passed, but also thousands of young Belarusians are passing uh, right now. And all these uh, challenges, they were th strengthening my um, uh, aspiration and my uh, willingness to live in a free country. <clears throat> and right now, 27 years after uh, this regime established, we have the real chance uh, for changes. And uh, I am... Uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I must say that my dream is very close to become true because after so many challenges, so many horrible things, after four times I was in prison, uh, finally we can get to the real democracy and I think all Belarusians, nine million of us will be celebrating, same as all Europeans who support uh, the freedom movement. One of the times you were arrested was when you were about to do your examinations at the university. Uh, exactly. You know what happened, what, how they repressed? They don't uh, say that you're against Lukashenko, you go to jail. They say you're a hooligan. Uh, they expelled me from the university. I was uh, one of the best uh, students in the year, but they say, oh, you missed your exams, uh, so we will expel you from the university. But I say, guys, I missed exams because I was in prison. It's not my fault. I, I would love to pass these exams. So it became the reason for expulsion of me. Then uh, they next day, they took me to, to jail again, then to army, and they refused to accept me to any of 17 Belarusian universities I applied to. And um, uh, later, um, I found out that there is a, a big part of the Belarusian population who are just following these events, but they are silent, they are calm. What the regime wants, they want the majority of people to stay away of politics. It's not necessary you know, to suppress the most active. The most important is to make the majority not participate. And what I was trying to do the whole my life with journalism primarily, to activate those in gray zone who want perhaps better life, but who don't want to risk. Yeah. 
I love that word hooligan. It's one of the only words adopted in Russian and obviously in Belarusian uh, from 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 Irish. And I, it was a frequent charge when I was in Russia uh, against anybody who demonstrated they were a charge with hooliganism. Um, so thank you, Frank. I'd, I'd like to invite you now to speak for maybe about five minutes or so to bring us up to date on the situation regarding Belarus. Uh, last year, miracles happened. Uh, for, uh, as I mentioned, for 26 years before, we had this sleeping mode of the society. Uh, Lukashenko managed to dispel parliament, to destroy all political parties, no free press, no free website, uh, major resources are blocked. So there was a vacuum. Lukashenko basically napalmed the civil society. It was absolutely empty, dry field of nothing, where no initiative uh, can grow. And last year, when COVID started, on social networks, initiatives of volunteers uh, emerged. These initiatives were helping doctors, patients, all those who suffered from COVID because authorities, they say there is no COVID, uh, there is, we don't see it and we will not help you. So thousands were dying and authorities um, consistently ignored this fact. So people started to organize themselves and it took two, three months to build alternative system of self-support. And this system, three months before presidential elections, it switched from COVID support to civil society support. People suddenly realized how powerful they are. And you people who supported uh, this COVID, anti-COVID campaigns, those who volunteered, but also those from the Mentatura, from elites, they joined the presidential campaign. And they say, guys, I am enough. I want to change Belarus for better because of COVID, COVID is uh, showed that this government disrespects its own people. And uh, this infrastructure built during COVID crisis it helped to collect signatures in support of alternative candidates for Belarus. And we got many new faces, bloggers, bankers, uh, IT specialists who became alternative to Lukashenko and Belarusians saw it and say, oh gosh, you know, how it's possible. We have so many bright people who can become the president. So if there is no only one Lukashenko who is smart enough to become president. And the movement started. People volunteered, collected signatures, protested every day then police crack down again and again, but people did not stop because people say it's we, it's our land, you know, we, we, we are uh, host here, you know, we, we want democracy and freedom. And this movement, this snowball, it's, it became so big that authorities were not able to stop it. It was last summer, 2020, but the biggest hit happened exactly one year ago uh, in June, July, when all major forces united in one. Three female leaders, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, running on behalf uh, of her uh, husband, uh, Valeria uh, Veronika Tsipkala, uh, running on behalf of her husband, uh, um, uh, Valeria Tsipkala, and Maria Kalesnikova, uh, the uh, mate, the, the friend, colleague of uh, Viktor Babarika. They said, we will be together. And this female trio, this photo, famous photo when they three of them say we will run against Lukashenko it's part the hope and this hope it helped people to go to streets to get enough bravery to resist openly and August 9 uh, after elections thousands hundreds of thousands appeared on the streets and this is this is how it started and uh, we are one year after uh, just how bad is the repression in uh, Belarus how many people are in prison and uh, how dangerous is it to, to demonstrate today? It's uh, extremely dangerous. Uh, in one year after this positive optimist movement uh, has sparked, Belarus uh, society has grown, developed, changed its quality. So this is one consequence. Another consequence, the regime became very Stalinist-like regime from this authoritarian type of um, um, uh, ruling, they moved to totalitarian, totalitarianism. Uh, KGB works with people. There are many informants in every organization, every company who are snitching on their own colleagues. Sometimes uh, um, uh, parents are informing KGB and secret services 
about their kids, about their children. Oh, my kids are involved in these subversive activities. So Lukashenko managed to, to get back the country to this dark time of 1930s. Some of the scenes we have seen, we observed, they remind uh, the scenes from Orwell, 1984. Some of these scenes, as you mentioned, are like Kafka. You know, when people come to trial, no one knows what's happening, like Kafka's process. No one knows what the person is accused of. And only after three or four rounds of trial, the judge found the reason to, to punish the person. The woman, um, old woman, um, uh, is punished by $1,000 fine only because she has white um, uh, blues and red uh, tie uh, on, on, on herself. So they gave her $1,000 uh, fine and the pension uh, she receives every month, it's about $150. So basically she is not able to pay this money. So it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. And people, you know, like in Stalin times, people are sitting near their homes, waiting uh, till night, uh, prepared and packed, waiting who will be taken next. 35,000, already 36,000 was detained in 10 months. 36,000 people. Uh, about 3,000 people are under criminal charges and might face up to death penalty. About 20 people are accused in terrorism, including Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. The um, uh, former candidates, presidential candidates, uh, they will have trial next week and uh, you know, they might face up to 15 years for absolutely fake reasons. It's incredible and Belarusians are really scared. I, I never believed that terror can be so powerful. It sounds like uh, Lukashenko was looking for, um, to North Korea for some of his uh, methods of repression. Um, let me ask you about the, the topic that's uh, been uh, broadcast internationally recently. That's the kidna kidnapping of your colleague, Roman Protasevich, uh, when the Ryanair flight was diverted to Minsk um, and forced to land there. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're close to Roman Protasevich and that uh, he was arrested and with his girlfriend uh, imprisoned. Um, He's appeared on, on Belarusian television, uh, apparently um, uh, saying, you know, he's been treated very well, etc. What's going on there, do you think? I think he's been uh, tortured. He was forced to collaborate with KGB. We all know that the methods of uh, KGB are the same as um, uh, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, if you are... Uh, dragged there, if you're in hands of secret services, uh, you cannot get out of there. And you know, this the real heroes, you know, who are tortured and, uh, and uh, resist and say, I will not tell anything to you. It's only in movies. And the real truth is, if you're under, if you're in their uh, underground cell, you don't have choice. Uh, the only difference is how far you can go with your collaboration how much moral, um, uh, how much morality you can save when you're um, working with them. And longer you stay in the hands of um, secret services, in the hands of KGB, lesser human, lesser humanic, humanist you, you uh, remain. Um, it's very difficult to say what, um, what Uh, when he was put on public at the press conference speaking to foreign media and diplomats about um, uh, that uh, I support Lukashenko, that uh, I prefer to stay in prison, it's, it's a safe place to me, uh, we shouldn't analyze the content because this is not real Roman Protasevich. He is the hostage and he speaks with no, his, it's not his words what we hear from him. Yeah. It struck me that perhaps he's worried about uh, the treatment of his girlfriend if he um, if he didn't cooperate. Um, you, you you mentioned the demonstrations last year, which we all watched on television uh, with um, great interest and um, and sympathy. And uh, I'm wondering what your tactics will be in the future, given that I gather that 
uh, strike action didn't quite materialize last autumn as hoped. And uh, demonstrations have not uh, resumed this year uh, as perhaps you hoped uh, earlier when the good weather returned. So what's your strategy now to uh, continue um, to press for democracy in, in, in Belarus? Um, our strategy does not change. Actually, uh, we want free and fair elections. And this makes Belarus uh, case very clear. It's not about overthrowing uh, Lukashenko himself. It's not about bringing one party to, to, um, to power. It's only about having free elections, a very basic need. Something we were deprived of, something that were stolen uh, from Belarus. Uh, but in order to get free elections, we need to um, find allies within the regime who will support the cause. But the regime is keeping all the elites around it in the absolute fear. So what we are trying right now, on one hand, to work with regime's elites, to split them. We work with Slaviki, with army, with businesses. All those who see that without Lukashenko, in democratic Belarus, they can gain more than, to, than with Lukashenko. But on the other hand, we are trying to mobilize these grassroots initiatives. But it's very difficult because from the very beginning, the revolution itself, it was not sparked from the top. It was very bottom top. And even Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, she is not real manager of revolution. She is the leader. She is like a spokesperson for the revolution. All these uh, protests, strikes, um, doctors' uh, rallies, uh, uh, teachers' um, uh, protests in, in universities, it was organized by themselves, without the management, without coordination. What we have right now to give them hope, energy, but also to help them to sustain the structures they have. And when this critical moment X will come, we will have structures on the ground ready to um, ready for the, another, for the new wave of protest. And we will have allies within the elites who will support this change. This will force the regime to release all political prisoners to uh, start the dialogue on new elections. This is how we see it. Yeah. One, of, one of the core uh, principles of John Hume um, bringing, um, uh, helping to end the conflict in Northern Ireland was dialogue. Are you saying that dialogue has already started and is under underway between uh, you abroad uh, in exile and elements in the uh, stru power structures in, in Belarus who s foresee that their change is coming? Uh, first of all, dialogue and negotiations are the only solution to this crisis. Since we chose the peaceful uh, way of protest and peaceful way of revolution, there is no other way. Um, there is possibility that people around Lukashenko himself, they will overthrow him and there will be um, internal uh, um, coup um, but it doesn't mean that we should stop uh, putting pressure from uh, from the bottom, from the people, because we don't want to change Lukashenko to another Lukashenko, one dictator to another dictator. So this mobilization, the dialogue, it's also the process of um, uh, of uh, educating society, involving society, and making society uh, more mature in terms of decision-making process and participation in politics. Um, at this moment, a regime, Lukashenko himself and his closest cronies, they don't want to talk. They are not ready to talk. They are so scared. They are living in bunker with Kalashnikov. Perhaps you all seen the scene when Lukashenko was flying helicopter with his son in the um, uh, with Kalashnikov and this armored vest, and that, that was really Yanukovych's moment when Lukashenko was so scared, ready to flee. And this is his biggest nightmare. Uh, right now, he still thinks he can raise the stakes. And before he is um, cornered finally, he will have uh, more um, ways out. Um, he understands that he is done. He understands that his time is over. But he really, he is really as the cornered person. He doesn't know how to get out of the situation to save the face but also to guarantee his safety to his family and his um, assets and assets of his cronies. And this is something we can discuss during the dialogue or negotiation. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that uh, the nightmare for Lukashenko. Um, I, I've often thought that uh, Putin's nightmare is that what, is, what may happen and what you hope will happen in Belarus, the establishment of democratic society, might uh, inspire the democratic forces in Russia uh, to press for a similar change. So I mean, what is the relationship between Vladimir Putin and uh, Lukashenko? How would you describe it? Uh, so uh, I would say the relationship between, uh, between these governments are symbiotic. Uh, they got used to each other. Uh, they are, for so many years, are ruling their countries. They, they know how to work with each other. Putin and Lukashenko, perhaps they hate, uh, actually, um, um, each other as well, but uh, they never show it because they understand that Lukashenko is popular in Russia, Putin is popular in Belarus, and they need to demonstrate friendship because it gives them some, uh, some loyalty of their own supporters. As for Lukashenko right now, this symbolic public support of Putin, it also guarantees that his um, people, cronies, army, nomenclatura, uh, will not uh, leave, will not resign, will not defect. Lukashenko is really afraid of the betrayal. So uh, and until he has this uh, symbolic support from Russia, it helps him to keep um, uh, loyalty and these people around him. But I don't think that uh, Kremlin, Russia will be supporting Lukashenko for longer. It costs a lot, this support, but also it sparks the discontent and the negative attitude to Russia among Belarus. You know, the positive attitude, uh, we always had quite a friendly relationship with Russia, Belarus and Slav Russian people, but longer Kremlin supports Belarus, the more Belarusians believe that Russia is guilty in this crisis that is happening in the country. Given what you say, do you find that the, there are elements in the Russian media and um, Russian trolls and uh, internet that are actively opposing you and helping Lukashenko? Uh, there are many, many groups of trolls. Uh, there are whole fabrics, factories of bots who are attacking us constantly. And personally, me, I receive death threats. Uh, thousands times a day uh, from uh, real figures, from fake figures, from anonymous accounts on Instagram and YouTube. But uh, this is the reality because the, the major, their goal is to demoralize us, our team, Svetlana Tikhanovska personally, she's the main target for many of these uh, groups. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes it works because it really confuses people, it creates noise, and many people who even support us and share values, you know, seeing thousands of these negative comments, they feel a toxic atmosphere. And this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to uh, toxicate uh, this uh, Belarusian democratic movement, which is very clean, very positive, very optimistic, built on solidarity, um, uh, dignity, um, uh, mutual respect. But they toxicated with these attacks, accusations, fakes. Um, uh, this is how it works in the world of technologies. Uh, one of the, the uh, aims of this conference is to explore how Europe uh, can help uh, in evolving situations as in Ukraine and in Belarus in particular. Uh, you obviously are, are being given um, uh, concrete help in the fact that uh, you're uh, operating from Lithuania. Um, uh, that's one European country that is very much involved. And of course, the sanctions now being imposed and which will be imposed will have play a large uh, role in, the, in, in what's to happen in the future. But I'd like to ask you, um, uh, Franak, uh, might sanctions not um, have a counterproductive effect by uh, pushing uh, Lukashenko even more into the embrace of Vladimir Putin than uh, uh, the fact that he has to rely more and more on Russia to support him. 
And might this uh, uh, also enable Russia to become more involved in Belarus, Putin's Russia? Uh, first of all, not sanction Pushkin, uh, Belarus in terms of Russia, but uh, Lukashenko is Russia. And uh, not people are suffering not because of sanctions, they're suffering because of the regime. What makes mm -hmm. all possible, people are suffering, people are fired, uh, half thousand of businesses were closed in last year. This is not a result of sanctions. Sanctions were not imposed even yet. Only symbolic uh, 80 people on the sanction list, which means nothing, uh, which doesn't have big impact. Uh, these are not real sanctions. Mm -hmm. So regarding uh, integration with Russia, there is no further space for integration. Belarus and Russia in the current uh, situation are so close, they have joined uh, air defense, they have joined uh, uh, or common or coordination in the banking sphere. Uh, it's so close that further integration mean, means loss of the sovereignty and independence of Belarus which Belarusians will never accept and which Lukashenko will not go for because um, when Belarus lost sovereignty, Lukashenko lost any chance to stay in power. So uh, this is the narrative that sanctions put Belarus in hands of, of Putin. These are more narrative of Lukashenko himself, of propaganda. Even Minister Mackey, uh, he always repeats you know, the West that if you will be put in sanctions on us, we will go to Russia. You know, this is a blackmail uh, approach, of course, but also another argument was if you will put sanctions on us, we will destroy civil society. You now, these are two uh, narratives, um, blackmail-like narratives, which, um, which are, first of all, bluffing. Second, uh, they supposed to create hesitation among the Western democracy. What we have to do, we have to unite Europe, nations, politicians, from all specters, from all wings, from all parties. And Europe right now, regarding Belarus, can take unified position and can show this strong stand on uh, values that Europe is built on. And this is what we want. You know, let's not allow uh, Lukashenko to separate, to divide us, but this narrative is there pushing. Uh, Belarusians will never accept the loss of independence again. There is no village in Belarus which will uh, be happy Belarus to join other country. There is no uh, division on the West and East, similar to Ukraine. The context is different, and um, let's not uh, let's 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 take uh, let's understand Belarus is independent sovereign country, and Belarus is fighting for democratic elections. Uh, they see independence their main value. Yeah. Uh, what more would you like to see Europe doing uh, than they're doing at the moment? Uh, there are, there are so many things that can be done. Uh, on one hand, it's very important to show Belarusians the positive alternative, the future, that they are in the, after crisis ends, after elections, they will have friends in European Union, um, uh, but not only, not limited to European Union. Uh, it's very important to send a signal to Belarusians that we will Mm, we as the West, we will be standing on the on the uh, democratic principles. It's very important that the EU uh, adopted comprehensive plan for Belarus, which provides the three billion of uh, um, aid to Belarus um, after changes, after reforms, uh, and altogether the whole plan um, is up to ten billion of dollars. This helps even businesses and the manufacturer to see the. Uh, the alternative to Lukashenko's promises of a good life under his rule. Let's understand that Lukashenko doesn't have anything to offer except of violence and except of status quo, which is not uh, so satisfying to many. Uh, Europe can um, uh, pressurize the regime and his wallets, but also fight corruption. Lukashenko's uh, regime is built on corruption schemes. Uh, basically, even this, you know, um, smuggling of European goods to Russia, avoiding sanctions, every, most of these uh, schemes are built on, on, on Belarusian, uh, through Belarusian companies and, and, uh, and schemes. So we, we, uh, we must investigate together with our European colleagues and journalists how to stop these schemes. Um, Europe can send a message to Belarusian political prisoners, uh, messages of solidarity, uh, it's very important to um, uh, provide technical assistance to um, uh, human rights defenders, 
because they are on the ground helping families of political prisoners, but also to media outlets. Most of them were closed in last month, in last year. No independent media. The biggest portal could be why, which was covering almost 60% of population of Belarus, was cracked down, closed, all the management in prison. So right, we have to build the new media infrastructure. And finally, what, what Europe and the West can do uh, to bring perpetrators to justice. You know, it shouldn't be impunity. Even when, when changes happen, we should not forget. Otherwise, the history might repeat. So international investigation, collecting evidence of human rights crisis, international tribunal must be planned now uh, if we want to avoid impunity, but also if we want to prevent other crises like the Belarusian one in other parts of the world, the uh, policy, the strategy must develop right now. If we don't want other airplanes hijacked by Lukashenko's fighter jets in other uh, countries of the world, um, similar situations happening, uh, the response must be um, strong, brave, swift, prompt. Is there a, I'm sure in Russia they see, from the Kremlin, they see Belarus as a buffer state between uh, Russia and uh, the European Union. Uh, I'm interested to know, is, is there a European mindset now in the Belarusian people? Uh, do they see Europe um, as, uh, do, they, do you see um, the future for Belarus as uh, a member of the European Union? rather than a member of the um, uh, alliance of, of states that Moscow has promoted with Armenia and Belarus and, um, uh, and Russia? Uh, first of all, um, Belarusians see themselves as the part of Europe already. Uh, Belarusians see themselves as the center of Europe. And we have even several monuments uh, in, in Belarus uh, marking it. this is the center of Europe. So for many Belarusians, there is no need to move either way, because we are already Europeans. Many journalists ask why you don't have European EU flags on the protest. We say we have white, red, white flags, like the one behind me, right? And this is already European flag. It's a historic Belarusian flag from Middle Ages. So we don't need to prove anyone anything already. We are Europe already. And in Belarusian society, there is consensus that we can be uh, uh, friends with all the sides, with the West and East, with North and South. Um, we don't want to be hostages of this paradigm and this um, um, competition between the West and the East. Uh, I think this is um, time uh, for Belarusians to think uh, where they want to be in the future, but it's not up to us, Osvetlana um, Tsikhanovska uh, personally, to decide where Belarus should go after. I think when Belarus become democratic and free, Belarusians will get access to information. Belarusians will feel and understand and will decide where they, go, they, where they want to go. But we first, but first step is first, uh, but first step is to conduct the uh, elections where they will be able to, to choose their leadership and to express their own um, uh, aspirations and, uh, and um, uh, vision. I'd like to ask you about um, um, how you see the summit meeting between um, Mr. Biden and Mr. Putin uh, recently. Um, I recall that um, uh, the United States was very influential and played a leading role in the peace process in Ireland. And I'm wondering how you see the United States role uh, in the evolving situation in Belarus. Uh, you, the United States uh, were uh, supportive uh, since the very beginning. Uh, Steve Began from State Department uh, came to Vilnius to visit Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya uh, last August. One of the first um, um, politicians who visited her, and Steve Began spoke with um, uh, Lavrov and the Russian administration about Belarus back then. Uh, when uh, Joe Biden was elected and the new leadership came to power, they continued this policy. So in the United States, Belarus issue is unifying. Uh, all support uh, is bipartisan, uh, which is very uh, important to us. 
Uh, right now we see uh, after a new administration finally formed its state department and, and, and then decided on its foreign policy, we can expect more involvement of the U.S. Uh, very soon. Uh, U.S. appointed new ambassador to Belarus, which can't come to Minsk because she was denied a visa. She was not given a visa, Julie Fisher. So, but she's continuing working as ambassador, not being in the country, which is also extraordinary. Uh, and um, we want uh, the U.S. to coordinate its efforts with the EU, with UK, with Canada, and with Ukraine. It's very important that uh, all uh, allies, pro-democracy allies, to support us. Hopefully, one day Russia will join them as well. Uh, they will be speaking with one voice and have joint common position on Belarus. Because what uh, Lukashenko wants to do, he wants to divide countries, nations, political forces. Uh, we want to unify. Belarusian crisis, Belarusian story is perhaps one of the most clear story uh, which is happening right now in the world. There is no gray here. It's only black and white, very clean. And there is a aggressive usurper uh, who beat uh, his own people. And there are uh, nation, there is nation which is uh, struggling for uh, its, uh, its uh, dignity, right to self-determination. Uh, democratic um, uh, elections. Uh, so the U.S. Um, must, uh, should, can uh, help Belarusians in just uh, in in uh, in the struggle. And uh, when we ask, yeah, but you don't, have, you are not afraid that this is interference in Belarus affairs. We say, look, support for democracy and human rights is not interference. And if 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 you want to count it as interference, then interfere, because this is something where Belarusians rely on you, because these are values which needs international consensus. These values of freedom, human rights, democracy, they are international, they are global, and they are not limited by, by uh, borders of one or another state. Well, we covered a lot of ground, and um, I must say that um, I, conclude from what you're saying that um, I, I, me personally, I feel a bit more optimistic now about the future of Belarus from what you've told me. I'd like to ask one final question. 30 years ago, the leaders of Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, that was Yeltsin, Kravchuk and uh, Shuskevich, uh, they met secretly in Belarus, as you know, and declared the end of the Soviet Union. And since then, uh, the three Slavic nations have gone their separate ways. Um, Russia is an autocracy, to say the least. Belarus, a dictatorship. And Ukraine is striving for its place in Europe. I want you to think ahead, uh, Franek. Ten years from now, how do you see the future of these three countries? I'm sure that Belarus will be free, democratic, open, uh, prosperous. Uh, I'm sure that Ukraine will continue um, moving to its own um, uh, sovereignty, its, its path, but we will be the closest uh, friends and allies. And I hope that uh, Russia will conduct the democratic reforms as well, uh, will join the, the global community of the free world, and uh, will be um, uh, helping its uh, own neighbors uh, to but but not challenging uh, them. Uh, in order to 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 this happen, uh, we should stick with our principles, ideas, not forget about democracy. Uh, the things like real politics, etc., there, uh, they are not helping us. Uh, we must always remind ourselves um, that that only democracy and freedom can bring stability uh, to the world. Uh, we must and also divide uh, governments and the people. Very often when we speak about Russia, we uh, say Russian and Russians, but I think Kremlin is not Russian. And it's very important to emphasize, same as Lukashenko is not Belarus. And uh, I, I don't like when uh, to read the headlines, Europe put sanctions on Belarus, no. Europe put sanctions on Lukashenko and his cronies. 
So if we will learn that, but also when we will learn that there is no such thing as sphere of influence, that no Belarusian brain is Russian sphere of influence, it's obsolete, obsolete uh, thinking. Uh, it will be much easier to all of us to, um, uh, to move forward. Well, on that rather upbeat note, uh, Franek, I'd like to bring this uh, conversation to a close, a very enlightening conversation. And I've learned a lot and I know the participants will uh, have been listening very um, carefully to, to what you've had to say about what's happening in Belarus today and in the future. So on behalf of uh, the conference organizers, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. We shall overcome. Thank you. The process in Northern Ireland, as far as I am concerned, has been most heavily inspired by the inspiration of this place. When I first came here in 1979, I tell this story often, I went for a walk across the bridge from Strasbourg to Kiel. I stopped and I thought, 30 years ago, if I had stood in this bridge and said, don't worry, although there's 25 million people dead for the second time in a century, and for centuries these peoples of Europe have slaughtered one another, now it's all over, and in 30 years they will all be together. I might have been sent to see a psychiatrist. But it happened. And let us not forget that European Union is the best example, as we have learned, in the history of the world of conflict resolution. And the philosophy that created European Union and the peace of Europe is the philosophy, if you study it, that is at the heart of our agreement. Respect for difference and for diversity. The creation of institutions which respect that diversity but which allow all sections to work together in their common interests. Economics, spill their sweat, not their blood. And by doing that, begin the real healing process of breaking down the barriers of centuries and the new society evolves. That is the philosophy of European Union and it's the philosophy of real peace. And might I add, that is the philosophy that we should be sending to areas of conflict in the world. We should not be sending armies. We should be sending a philosophy. And given the philosophy that we have in this building, it's a philosophy that will resolve conflict everywhere. Because at the end of the day, all conflict is about the same thing. It's about seeing difference as a threat. And what we all have to learn is what the peoples of Europe learned, and we are learning in Northern Ireland. Difference, whether it's your race or your religion or your nationality, is an accident of birth. And it's not something we should be engaged in conflict about. It's something we should respect. Thank you very much for your expression today. The Nobel Peace Prize was collected by the heads of the EU's three main institutions. The ceremony took place in Norway's capital, Oslo. The European Union was awarded the prize for its role in uniting the continent and bringing about reconciliation after two world wars. The prize is for all Europeans and leaders from across Europe stood to show their support. The chairman of the prize committee praised the work of the EU. Jean Monnier said that nothing can be achieved without human beings, but nothing becomes permanent without institutions. The EU has constantly been a central driving force throughout these processes of reconciliation. The EU has, in fact, helped to bring about both the fraternity between nations and 
the promotion of peace congresses, of which Alfred Nobel wrote in his will. Germany and France were commended for turning from old enemies into allies. The presence here today of German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President François Hollande make this day very particular, symbolic for all of us, I believe. When I think of the State of the Union, I am reminded of the words of John Hume, one of the great Europeans who sadly passed away this year. If so many people live in peace today on the island of Ireland, it is in large part because of his unwavering belief in humanity and conflict resolution. He used to say that conflict was about difference and that peace was about respect for difference. And as he so rightly reminded this house in 1998, and I quote, the European visionaries decided that difference is not a threat. Difference is natural. Difference is the essence of humanity, end of quote. And these words are just as important today as they ever have been.
Good uh, day to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Keating. I'm the executive director of the Brussels-based European Institute of Peace. Uh, for those of you who don't know about us, we were established seven years ago uh, as a resource for the European Union and for European states uh, that wish to have a vehicle for supporting conflict resolution, dialogue, and mediation work. Uh, and it is my enormous privilege to be asked to mediate uh, this session. Uh, I cannot resist adding my voice to the many others who have paid tribute uh, to John Hume and indeed Pat Hume, uh, who clearly was a colossus uh, on the European stage. Um, and his voice and his approach are needed more than ever, both around the world and in Europe and indeed in Northern Ireland, uh, where, of course, the extraordinary achievement of the Good Friday, the Good Friday Agreement is such an inspiration and is now uh, uh, in, in, some, in some jeopardy. Uh, my grandfather happened to be an Irish politician, so I've been following this very carefully. Uh, and uh, it really is an inspiration that this event has been brought together and I hope it will contribute uh, to infusing his spirit uh, into uh, the work of a much broader range of actors, European and otherwise. Clearly the European Union is the biggest conflict resolution initiative the world has ever seen uh, and it is extraordinarily well placed uh, to contribute uh, to efforts uh, around the world to resolve uh, and I hope mediate uh, violent conflict and to find sustainable uh, peace agreements uh, backed uh, by economic and social arrangements that might contribute to their endurance. Uh, we have about just over 50 minutes for this session. Uh, I will introduce the speakers uh, in a second. I think the format is I will ask each of them to speak for five, six, seven minutes, um, and then have a short conversation with them, and then invite uh, questions from the floor. And if the technology works and my uh, I'm up to it, the idea is that I will be receiving these questions and fielding them uh, to uh, the speakers. Uh, so please uh, do uh, you know, put those questions in the chat box uh, as, as quickly as you can. Uh, the, clearly, the, 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 the subject of this session is EU support to conflict resolution and peace building in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, and, you know, this is such a broad topic. There's only so much we can do in 50 minutes, but clearly some sense of the EU's achievements, the current challenges uh, and ways forward. It would be terrific to, to mine the, the knowledge and experience of our speakers to that end and to have questions to them on that basis. The region, I don't need to tell you, is facing so many challenges, some of them deep rooted related to things like climate change, uh, environmental degradation, uh, demographic changes. Uh, governments and authorities throughout the region are having great difficulty on delivering the expectations of the population, especially young people and often women. Um, there are increasingly authoritarian approaches in many, in many places, uh, and there's the prospect and reality of civil disturbances in many places, characterized in part by uh, unaccountable security forces, abuse of human rights, uh, and uh, perennial uh, gender uh, inequity, uh, many democratic deficits. And the promise of the Arab Spring was, was not fulfilled. Um, I would say, just from my perspective, three things uh, jump out as the kind of some of the big issues. One is the fault line between uh, Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia and the broader Arab world. And one of our speakers, Federico Mogherini, uh, is we could not have a better person uh, to speak to us, uh, share some insights on that one. 
Uh, there's also the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is both old and very fresh and uncertain, the absence of a political horizon for Palestinians, and the prospect, unfortunately, of more conflict, more suffering, more humanitarian crisis. And then there is the phenomenon of internationalized civil wars uh, with extraordinary humanitarian consequences. And we see that in a number of places. Yemen perhaps is the most egregious, but Syria and Libya. Uh, Libya is uh, particularly timely that we have Zara Langi with us. She's actually in Geneva participating in the talks on Libya. And I hope she will uh, you know, lift the curtain on some of that. So without further ado, let me introduce the two speakers in the order in which uh, they've agreed to speak. Federico Mogherini really does not need much of an introduction. Um, among her many uh, you know, achievements, including as foreign minister of Italy and high representative uh, and vice president of the European Union for foreign affairs and security policy, she also co-chairs the UN high level panel on internal displacement. She's a rector of the College of Europe She's on the board of trustees of the International Crisis Group, and she's on the advisory council of the Munich Security Conference. And I'm probably missing out about 80 other, uh, you know, handles she has, but those are the ones that jump out at me as being particularly relevant for this conversation. And then Zara Lange is a strategist, peace activist, gender expert, academic and researcher. Um, uh, and she has contributed significantly to the body of research on Libyan transition and peace building. And she founded and is the chief executive of the Libyan Women's Platform for Peace, as well as a member of the legal committee of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. I am truly uh, delighted to have such uh, qualified people to talk to us from very different perspectives on this topic of EU support to conflict resolution and peace building in the Middle East and North Africa. Federica, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Zara, for joining uh, in this uh, uh, session. And let me also thank the organizers of, uh, of this important uh, uh, day of reflection, two days of reflection. And let me join you, Michael, in uh, um, stressing how relevant uh, the lesson and the, um, the, the, the example uh, of John Hume is uh, today for Europe, for the region, for the rest of the world, I think. If you allow me, that will be also my starting point uh, for uh, commenting and reflecting upon the three main uh, uh, areas uh, of, uh, um, of conflictuality we face in the region today. Uh, because I think that uh, the lesson we've learned in Europe, in the European Union at least, but also in Europe in general, is that there's no better way of solving a conflict and overcoming the conflict and reconciling then uh, focusing on the uh, common interests and the joint interests that we can uh, develop or, or incentivize uh, across the conflict lines and try to make uh, uh, a conflict situation, a win-win situation, uh, at least uh, um, in the mid and long term. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the European Union integration process is all be about that, about uh, making formal enemies uh, starting from the six founding member states um, and, and starting from France and Germany in the very first place, uh, transforming themselves uh, in, into not necessarily friends in the beginning, but uh, sharing so many interests, starting from economic interests, that making war uh, was, uh, um, was not convenient anymore. I think that was the click uh, in our founding fathers' and mothers' minds, uh, making uh, peace more convenient than war, uh, for um, for our countries. And I think that this lesson, this principle, uh, is very much uh, relevant for the Mediterranean uh, and, and North Africa and, and the Middle East today. You mentioned three um, conflictual dividing lines, uh, three different crisis areas uh, today. We could mention many others, but I think that these three uh, keys, the, these three elements for, for reading the region are uh, the very appropriate ones. Um, the Iran um, Gulf or Iran Arab uh, area of conflict, uh, the Israel or Palestinian, but in general terms, uh, the Israel or Arab um, conflict, and uh, the internationalization of civil wars uh, with three key points uh, Yemen, Syria, and Libya. I think these three elements of um, 
these three analytical elements are, are extremely relevant for us to uh, read the region and, and try to understand how the European Union can support moving them forward in a positive direction rather than uh, standing still or, or, or actually even going backwards. Um, now, if I can start with actually looking at the three of them, I think um, the, the, the key elements that made Europe uh, move from conflict to peace and, and economic development and prosperity and finally political integration and economic and social integration, um, uh, the element of sharing or building a shared interest uh, across uh, the dividing lines uh, is a relevant element for the three. Uh, for, the, for the three dimensions you mentioned. If you look at the Iran Gulf um, uh, crisis uh, or, or dividing or conflicting line, for sure, you know, starting from the assumption that you cannot change geography, uh, you cannot make your, your neighbor disappear from one day to another, even if you wish it happens, um, then it is quite clear that uh, the Gulf and Iran have an interest uh, to share. Uh, starting from an economic one, but uh, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, the climate challenges that are in, are indeed very relevant, uh, or the challenges linked to the pandemic and the fact that people move around the region, uh, and actually the connections, uh, the, the so-called people-to-people connections, the family connections, the holiday connections, the, the the business travels connections across the Gulf are very intense or used to be very intense. I think that uh, no matter uh, how the political and institutional developments will will uh, will, will develop themselves, will, will determine uh, the landscape. Uh, I think that bottom line, uh, there is a shared interest across the Gulf region to find probably not ways to live in friendship. I think that will be unrealistic and probably very far away but probably to set up something similar to a security architecture for the region. You know, uh, even in Europe, uh, in, in the past decades, you didn't necessarily, and even today from time to time, you don't necessarily like each other, but you find a, a rational way of surviving with each other without hurting uh, each other's interests too much. I think this is the, the realistic and possible uh, sense of direction for the Gulf that the European Union can definitely accompany and support in trying to find a modus vivendi, as we would say in, in, in Latin, a way of, um, of, of not uh, crossing um, boundaries uh, that would make things uh, develop in dangerous situations and trying to contain uh, the risks and, and do damage control. I think that this is the realistic perspective for the Gulf, especially uh, with the new course in Iran. Uh, but I've noticed some openings uh, uh, on uh, uh, on the Emiratis and the Saudis li uh, um, side. I think the rest of the Arab world would uh, uh, would be much more pragmatic than uh, uh, than the Gulf countries in this respect. Um, also because of the mix of the uh, political landscape that uh, many Arab countries have uh, in in their own parliaments in their own uh, constituencies. Uh, that would make them a little bit more flexible, I believe, in terms of uh, relations with Iran. But I think the Gulf countries will uh, most likely, hopefully, uh, it's not wishful thinking, uh, start setting the stage for, um, for, for a way of living together without getting into open conflicts. Uh, and I think this might be beneficial for some of the inter internationalized civil conflicts you mentioned, for sure for Yemen, for sure for Syria. Uh, Libya is a different thing, but I'm sure that Zara will talk about that much more and much better than I can uh, in a few minutes. Um, let me say a, another word on uh, um, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, because indeed, as you mentioned, it's uh, the oldest conflict of the, of the region, um, and to me, uh, it's probably the most painful one, because uh, here, if you look at the elements of the conflict, if you look at the possible solutions to the conflict, and if you look at the motivations uh, that uh, should and would push uh, two sides and, and the accompanying sides around uh, Israel and Palestine uh, to, to move in the direction of a solution, uh, you actually find since quite some years uh, all, all the different elements already defined. I think this is a conflict everybody of goodwill and, and a certain rationality know and understand which is the landing zone, more or less. I think the criteria, the parameters are more or less defined and known and well-known. 
And I think there is a clear interest, even if it is very much overshadowed by the political discourse, especially in Israel, but also in Palestine, if you think of Gaza, especially, there is an overshadowing of, uh, of the real interests that the peoples there would have uh, in achieving a long-lasting, sustainable and just peace. It would be extremely rational as a choice to make peace there. Uh, what is missing is uh, political will, political leadership, and, um, and so far what has been missing has also been an international framework that could have accompanied these negotiations to, to come to, uh, to a positive conclusion. I'm, I, I've been too often too optimistic about that conflict to say it again, but I remain convinced that a solution is at hand, is possible, is sustainable, would be in the interest of everybody. Uh, the Palestinians, the Israelis that clearly cannot sustain a security situation like the one they're living today for another decade or so, or even more. Uh, and clearly, uh, there's no alternative. Uh, so I, I think that still the parameters that are very well known, internationally recognized in the UN framework, uh, and, and supported by the new US, not so new now, US administration, uh, are potentially uh, to be revived and renewed uh, for a new round of, uh, of negotiations or a, a new initiative. I really hope that this can happen soon because of, the, of all the conflicts of the region, Middle East, North Africa, the Mediterranean, this is probably the one that with the adequate political will, leadership and international accompanying uh, framework um, can uh, be the easiest to solve, in it, even if I know this sounds surreal, but I, I really believe it is. Uh, because if you look at all the alternatives, um, I, I think uh, it is quite clear um, that, uh, uh, that the road is more or less defined. Um, but indeed, um, it all depends on, uh, on the engine inside the two sides, and obviously uh, the incentives that the international community, starting from the European Union and the United States, can put in place. But I'm, I'm, I remain optimistic about the fact that that is a conflict that can be solved should there be enough political will to give it a push and a try. Um, while, as I said, on the Gulf, I, I think that the best possible scenario would be now be a sort of uh, containment uh, security architecture similar to the one we put in place in Europe um, a few decades ago with the Helsinki process um, to, to recognize uh, differences, challenges, threats, and, and find a way of, uh, of not precipitating them into an open conflict. I think that would be the most pragmatic and the most realistic way forward. On Libya, I leave it to Zara because uh, I'm also very curious to hear from her how she sees things from the inside and also from Geneva today. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to hearing her comments. Good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Federica. And you've raised uh, a lot of interesting points there and you know listening to you particularly about the people to people dimension of the Israel Palestinian conflict one wonders if there aren't lessons from the northern irish situation in which you know john hume celebrated diversity he celebrated difference he said this was the best basis for security uh, and for sorting things out uh, and you know that people do have multiple identities and you need political arrangements that can accommodate that. And that has been distinctly missing uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, 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 conflict. Uh, and if anything, I would argue that unfortunately the region, particularly places like Iraq, are seeing a kind of, you know, uh, an insistence upon exclusive identities with terrible, terrible consequences. But the distinction you draw between the Israel-Palestinian conflict and the, the Gulf one in terms of approaches are very interesting, and I'm sure we're going to come back to you with some questions on that, including on what you think uh, the EU, um, you know, uh, might have uh, to offer uh, uh, in addition to what it's already doing in terms of going forward. Zara, you're in the thick of things there in, in Geneva, uh, and, and we're keen to hear, thing, uh, you know, first of all, how things are going in the peace talks, but then if you can broaden out and give us your your thoughts on, you know, the, sort of, the bigger phenomenon of what's happening in Libya, and we can link it to some of the points we've already covered. Over to you. 
Yes, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Frederica, for applying the basis. Um, and thank you, uh, the Hume Foundation, for hosting this. And I'm really honored to be part of this. I really find the, the words of uh, John Hume very inspiring. And it's inspiring because it, it really expressed what we have always been uh, looking, the formula that we've been looking for, for uh, achieving sustainable peace and resol uh, resolving conflict in Libya. It, yes, it's respect of diversity, but then this respect of by diversity needs to be institutionalized. And I think this is a key uh, vehicle that we are missing. We usually um, uh, talk, but never walk the talk. And I think so far uh, with a turbulent uh, transition in Libya uh, that started with the, the, uh, the, uh, the uprising against uh, the dictatorship of Gaddafi, the NATO-led intervention, and then with the complete collapse of the state institutions and the civil war and the internationalized civil war. Um, I've been participating in the peace processes in Libya since 2013, the political uh, processes. I'm here at the track one political process. Uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, um, and uh, it doesn't look good because, again, we are not, uh, Frederica mentioned political will, and I think political will is key here, is the implementation, is the mechanism. How are we going to implement uh, a political deal? We always la uh, never think of the day after. There was an intervention, but what will happen after that intervention? Yes, we're grateful to uh, the, the, the first uh, international intervention in Libya that was under the, 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 the principle of uh, responsibility to protect. However, Libyans continue to question, where is this responsibility? Where is this doctrine? throughout the last 10 years, seeing all these wars. So I think the trust of Libyans, the faith of Libyans in an international uh, support assistance has been uh, really uh, shaken the last 10 years. I think it's a moment that we have to see a responsibility to build, moving from R2P to R2B. I think what we need to see, and to bring it to our talk today about a European uh, peace conference, is we want to see what exactly what happened after World War II, the Marshall Plans, exactly what Hume was talking about. It's respect for diversity, it's institutionalization, but then it is about the economic integration of uh, uh, the, the, the region. What we need to see is basically um, more work at addressing the root causes. It's, uh, we cannot have a, a deal, uh, politic, continue to have political deals, to have negative uh, peace that uh, are basically catered to appease um, corrupt uh, political leaders. Uh, we need to see more, uh, uh, and we need to go beyond this power sharing model to a, a, a model that is based on the sharing of responsibilities. We need to design the peace processes where we have the people rights, especially economic and social rights at the center. So it's not about politics, uh, political interests, ethnic interests, uh, tribal interests. Um, it's not about religious interests, ideologies. It's about really people's needs. That will make the real difference. And it's not enough uh, 
that we, uh, uh, and I have to be frank, to see this kind of lip service that the uh, EU is uh, supporting uh, Libyans, we need to see some kind of mechanism that translates that kind of strategic partnership that is based basically on respect of national ownership, on uh, the uh, respect of uh, inclusive peace, respect uh, on the paradigm itself that people are at the center of these uh, 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 policies. And we need to see, and we, we've seen, um, it was a great uh, initiative last year to have the Berlin Conference, where we have an international track, but then we need to go beyond that. Uh, how are we going to think of mechanisms that establish uh, sustainable peace that links basically peace to development and prosperity. And so there are many areas that we can work, especially uh, with the EU on, uh, especially that those that are related to, uh, uh, to uh, securing the borders, to the my issue of migration, but from an approach that upholds the respect of human rights, the rule of law. That, uh, that honors uh, 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 the well-being of uh, uh, the well-being of marginalized communities. That does not. Uh, we, we, it shouldn't be about securitized approaches. Uh, uh, it shouldn't be about short fixes. It should be more comprehensive approaches where we put uh, human dignity at the center and think how to do, address the root causes and develop mechanisms. And this is why uh, I find um, uh, Hume's talk about institutionalizing the, the peace is important and is what lack, is lacking not only in Libya, but in the entire Mediterranean region. So that's the same idea to address all the problems, bring them on the table, uh, build a peace that is based on uh, 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 addressing the root causes, addressing uh, and building economic um, uh, integration. What has been lacking, we always focus on it. There's no solution but the political solution. But political solution should not be meant uh, by it only uh, the political aspects. We need to, uh, uh, to see uh, that uh, conflicts uh, in our society, in the entire region, are multidimensional. So they need a multidimensional, a hybrid approach to address all these. And again, it's the economic rights of the people of the regions that needs to be upheld and respected well well thank you and you know i'm actually very struck that both of you have talked about you know the need for leadership uh but also framework so i, I have a question that i'm going to address to both of you but from slightly different angles and you know I, I don't know why, but I, I, I agree with the need for political leadership, but I sometimes worry that leadership emerges from movements rather than out of, out of, out of the sky. I mean, it tends to be as a result, you know, the great leaders like Martin Luther King, you know, come from movements. They don't, they, they, they're all Nelson Mandela or, 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 or whoever it, it, it may be. And, you know, I think, Zara, you're saying that there needs to be much more accountability to ordinary people, uh, to understanding their perspective on security, to understanding their perspective on their hopes and their future. And that a lot of, you know, the politics and diplomacy that goes on seems to be taking place at 20,000 feet, you know, rather than uh, being connected to these local uh, realities. Uh, and I think, if I understood correctly, there was a little bit of a criticism there that it wasn't just limited to the EU, but saying that there's a lot of your words lip service and not enough attention being paid to the needs of 
very ordinary people as a basis for fashioning you know, conflict resolution strategies uh, and uh, dialogue and, and political approaches. And Federica, you have been very clear that you know, there's a difference between the Arab is Iran thing, and, and I tend to agree with you. Which there's an absence of a framework as we have had in Europe. Um, uh, but you could argue in many of these other places, there has been insufficient political investment in what ordinary people want, uh, such as in Yemen, such as in Syria. I know it's slightly beyond our, our, our geographical area, but certainly such as in Afghanistan, whereby they cannot recognize you know, the relevance of political discussions taking place to their own security and to their own future. So Fed, starting with Federica, do you, do you think enough attention is given uh, to the voices and needs of ordinary people, you know, in, as it were, fashioning these things? Or is the world of so diplomacy so self-contained that it's an afterthought? You know, uh, the real question you're, you're asking is, uh, what is the uh, balance, which is the right balancing place, the spot, between ownership, local ownership, political ownership of peace processes locally and nationally, and the international support. Because the international community can, can develop all different mechanisms of support and, and uh, attention to the needs of civil society, local communities, uh, women and, and youth in the first place. When I was high representative, we've done a lot in this respect. But then, uh, let me be very blunt and, and, and candid, uh, then uh, you also relate to governing bodies uh, that need to lead their own peace process because it's their own country. And then you find missing links between the national leaderships, whatever that might mean in certain places, uh, and their, their, their own societies, their own communities, their own uh, people. And can the international community uh, jump over the hats of uh, uh, elected bodies or, or national interlocutors and reach out directly to the local communities? I believe it can. I believe it must and it should. But there is an, an intermediate level of, uh, of national authorities that indeed, uh, Zara is perfectly right, need to reconnect to their own societies and people. And sometimes this is one of the reasons for the conflict in the very first place. Uh, so uh, it, it's not just, uh, I, I wouldn't simplify or oversimplify things saying, uh, you know, diplomatic processes are happening up there in, in, in faraway rooms and, and, and the ordinary people don't, don't feel it, it's relevant. No, the, the point is not that one, I believe. The point is that, the international, that there's only so much that the international community can do to incentivize the national leaderships or even sometimes the, the local leaderships to, to connect to the needs of societies and communities without taking away the political ownership that has to be local and national. Uh, there is a missing link from, in, in most of conflict areas, there is a missing link. So part actually of the, of the work that the European Union needs to do together with the United Nations, for instance, uh, or, or regional organizations, um, in now moving away from the Mediterranean and North Africa, I think of many African conflicts, for instance, is this, this work that needs to be done to incentivize and support and, and help uh, the uh, national authorities or the local authorities uh, to give space and hear the voices of those they don't see and they are their own citizens uh, without patronizing and without jumping over their hats because at the end of the day they are the legitimate bodies that need to negotiate in the very first place. So I think that that is the real question. How does the international community, starting from the European Union, the UN system and so on and so forth, at the same time uh, incentivize and, and open the space for civil society to have their own place and negotiations to come close to the people and the people to come close to the negotiations and at the same time um, empowering the relevant authorities to sit around that table because at the end of the day you cannot have an agreement or a peace agreement or, or a peace deal uh, defined by international uh, bodies without the national authorities of those countries involved, whatever it means. And again, speaking about Libya, we could speak a lot <laughs> about what it means. But the, the missing point is this, that you have three layers, the local, 
the community, the what you say, the ordinary people. Sometimes that is also fragmented and very, very, very complicated to even read, uh, even from a local perspective. Then you have the somehow recognized national authorities, and then you have the international support system. And it's, uh, believe me, it's sometimes easier for the international support system to go directly local, but it's something that you cannot do because you cannot skip one level. So the complexity of how you incentivize a, a more joined up and a closer work that local, national, regional also, because don't forget the region, we're talking about internationalized uh, uh, civil conflict. It's in most cases, it's regionalized civil conflict. So you have actually four layers. You have the local, you have uh, with all its complexity, you have the, the, the national, whatever it means, and sometimes it doesn't mean much. Then you have the regional and you have the international support that cannot ignore any of these three layers. Um, and, and, and sometimes playing with one or the other uh, is complicated. What, what I know the European Union is constantly trying to do, and the UN the same, is to try to empower the local communities and the local voices to come up and be recognized and be represented as much as possible. But doing that without interfering heavily in the internal dynamics of power, which themselves, most of the cases, represent one of the elements of the conflict, is indeed a delicate exercise. Well, thank you. That's a very lucid uh, response. And Zara, I'd be interested in knowing what you think of what Federica has said. If I may offer just a couple of observations. Mm. You know, one of the things in Libya, of course, is there has been you know, different national authorities being supported by different international actors, which has massively complicated things. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the holy grail in a way is to having a unified international community that recognizes that it's in its common interest to work in concert to resolve these things. But one of the phenomena of international civil wars is precisely that does not happen. And by the way, in many of the places that I've worked in the Horn of Africa and Somalia and Afghanistan, one of the biggest problems has been divisions within the international community, uh, including in the last few years within the Arab world with different state actors playing different roles, you know, in the country. So I think the point is absolutely right. Uh, but I guess my question to you, Zara, would be in the light of what Federica has said, I mean, to what degree do you feel as a civil society activist and very networked, a degree of ownership. Do you feel strong ownership over the process uh, that is underway in terms of trying to resolve some of the deeper issues uh, facing Libya right now? Thank you, Michael. This question has never been more relevant. Uh, and this whole thing of what uh, Thankfully, uh, Frederica just mentioned of the, the three levels, local, national, and the um, international, has been over uh, abused. Actually, the stalemate that we are reaching right now, now to give um, a concrete example, is that we have spoilers representing the national institutions uh, who want to maintain the status quo not abiding by the Security Re Council resolution, the latest one, 2570, um, uh, which has endorsed the roadmap of the Libyan political dialogue, the track uh, one of the peace process. And in the name that there should be Libyan ownership, where we know civil society representatives at the table, like myself, with my uh, and human rights activists, and with social movements on the ground, grassroots movements, want to move ahead and want uh, to see elections um, as set by the roadmap at the end of the year on a set date, uh, 24th of December, but the, what has been obstructing the, uh, this round of um, uh, talks here in Geneva is that these spoilers represent, and I call them spoilers according to the Security Council resolution because according to the latest one, 
that uh, under the the chapter seven, the, uh, those who are um, obstructing the political and the peace and the electoral process will be considered as spoilers. Today, and for the last few days, we've been seeing, unfortunately, the international body, the UN, enabling the spoilers by putting on the table what is already been endorsed by the Security Council resolution. And these people are saying, the representatives of the national institutions who want to stay in power, who want to maintain the status quo, who uh, the, the last special envoy called them the political dinosaurs, are saying, no, it's not you dictate on us. It's uh, there should be sovereignty and national ownership. There's, this is the abuse. So there should be, uh, uh, how can we solve this? I think always, and it's good to see that there are three levels because the local is not necessarily in alliance with the national. Right. And the local is the community. And that's why we always need to amplify their voices. I would always say a rights-based uh, approach is what we want to see. And I would say that the respect of um, uh, rule of law is what to see, uh, we want to see, regardless of what's, uh, yes, we need ownership, we need inclusivity, but then respect and upholding of human rights, the international uh, framework of human rights and rule of law. Okay, well, look, I am going to be faithful to my, the task that's been given to me and relay to the two of you some of the questions that are coming in. Um, and we can then decide who answers them. Uh, I think one of them is clearly for Federica, but the others are more open. Um, one is uh, uh, Michael GD uh, is asking uh, whether the lessons from EU engagement in Syria uh, over the last decade, are there lessons that can be drawn from that that should be applied going forward and Myanmar is mentioned. Uh, Myanmar has been promoted to the Middle East and North Africa region for the purposes of this conversation but are there lessons that can be learned from that and I suppose behind that is you know the issue of lack of European unity perhaps mm -hmm. in approaching some of these conflicts perhaps behind that is the issue of the relationship uh, with the US and you know, what happened when, when the US went off script, as it were. A second question is from Guy Bannum, who asks that the notion of respecting diversity, maybe Zara, you could answer this one, should that extend to people who have deeply objectionable views? And I assume behind that includes people who do not believe in gender equity uh, and uh, women's rights, people who have who feel that their mandate is, you know, from God and they interpret it in very exclusive ways, should tolerance be extended to them? And then there's another question, which is to do with the emphasis on rights-based approaches, which either of you could ask, answer. But if you apply a rights-based approach to the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict, then surely uh, the, the, uh, the solution is not necessarily the one that has been um, you know, assumed for many years, because where you end up with that is, is, I think, behind this is an assumption that you have one state in which everybody enjoys human rights, not a two-state solution. So I guess that's a little bit of a, a question to both of you in terms of, you know, to what degree should rights-based approaches inform the politics, but specifically in Israel and Palestine, wouldn't that upend you know, the sort of consensus uh, that we've had for so long that the two-state solution is the answer. Uh, Federica, would you like to try and respond to any parts of these? I'll try. Like? Yeah. Yes, I'll try with pleasure. Uh, well, I'll start with the, with the rights-based solutions. Uh, in, in general terms, when you talk about uh, rights-based solutions to conflicts and crises, uh, you don't only take into consideration individual uh, rights, uh, and obviously that encompasses social, economic, and political, and civilian 
but also the community's uh, aspirations and, uh, uh, and in this case the aspiration of the people to have its own state uh, which is in itself a right uh, so I, I I would I know that there is a um, and we all know there is a, an ongoing debate uh, within the Palestinian camp uh, in this respect uh, whether the two-state solution still holds in terms of responding to their their aspirations and their needs or if uh, it wouldn't be wiser from their side to move towards a one-state solution. Um, I still believe that, uh, uh, well, this is probably the main motivation for the Israelis to move. Uh, if, if rationality prevails, uh, the, the Israeli leadership and people uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, better consider uh, moving towards the two-state solution before the Palestinians uh, decide to go for the one-state solution themselves. Uh, because I believe that that solution might be extremely challenging and, and complicated to hold and probably would bring more conflict uh, in, in the daily life. And as we have seen uh, during the last crisis we faced, uh, where actually uh, conflict was uh, uh, among communities, uh, inside communities, across communities, um, inside the Israeli state. So uh, I think that that, and, and again, I think here that the lesson of John Hume and, and Northern Ireland can tell us a lot about uh, how delicate uh, inter- and intra-communal uh, disputes and conflicts um, can, uh, can turn violent and be difficult to solve. So um, I, I, I would say I would stick to the, um, to, to the normally defined uh, right-based solution for the Israeli-Palestinian state in the terms of recognizing the rights of not only individuals, but also communities and, and the aspiration of of establishing its own state, which is still um, the stated interest and objective of the Palestinian Authority. And, and I think that, and I hope uh, that uh, there will be some uh, work renewed in this direction in the coming months, especially from the US administration. Um, on the lessons learned on, on, on Syria, you know, a lot of frustration uh, around that, uh, especially, um, you know, during my mandate, uh, we started to see the light at a certain moment, uh, exactly after the Iran nuclear deal, uh, in, uh, after the summer 2015, the esta establishment of, um, of the Syria um, uh, group uh, with all the different players around the table for the very first time, including Iran, but also the Gulf countries, Turkey. Uh, the, there was Russia, the United States, the UN. There was a glimpse of hope, I think. Uh, and then obviously everything derailed for different, many different reasons, and that would be probably too long to, to, to go deep into that. But the Syria crisis, I think, has, has one lesson to, 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 to teach uh, to the European Union, that is this one, that uh, the European Union can do a lot, but in some cases uh, it cannot do alone. In some cases it can, in some cases it can. I think in some conflict areas, the European Union can be the main driving force or the main accompanying uh, element uh, for, uh, uh, for, for accompanying a peace process, for incentivizing a peace deal, including what Sarah was mentioned, which is the, uh, somehow the, the, the capacity to, to create the economic uh, leverage, the incentives on the economic and social uh, side, which are in our experience, in the European experience, the key elements for uh, peace building. Uh, people need to have an interest in, in building peace. Uh, and, and this is something the European Union is very good in creating. Uh, so there are situations where the European Union can act alone or act as a leading force uh, from the international or regional uh, perspective. But there are some other cases where uh, the European Union can do a lot, but not everything. Uh, and um, Syria, I think, uh, has been a clear demonstration of the fact that, as well as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, the European Union alone cannot do cannot go the extra mile. We need to have the international community united around a project, uh, or at least an idea uh, of uh, of a peace process and and a perspective for a solution, uh, with a sense of ownership. Uh, locally, potentially, would be better, uh, but also with a, a somehow an agreed uh, or or commonly defined uh, roadmap or perspective under UN leadership with the US, the European Union, and the others on board. Otherwise, the connection between the local spoilers, the regional spoilers, and the international spoilers becomes impossible to face. 
And I think this has this has been what has happened in Syria. Uh, the, the complexity of the levels of spoilers has piled up so much that with all the goodwill, with all the humanitarian support, with all the negotiations, uh, without the European Union, the United States, the UN framework aligned, there was very little that could have been done by the European Union alone. And I have to say in this respect, uh, the change in administration in Washington was the defining moment for, for the diplomatic track to somehow derail. So hopefully there will be there will be some attention and some renewed efforts now. The problem is that by now the attention, the global attention over the conflict in Syria has has dropped, and, and I th I hope that this will not constitute a problem for uh, revitalizing some negotiating tracks because I believe there is a track there that can be explored. Uh, but it's true that in the meantime, uh, the international public opinion and most of our domestic public opinions have got uh, used to that war and, and somehow forgotten it, uh, which is always a mistake because as Afghanistan or Libya tells us, um, uh, you cannot really never forget uh, or, or, or give a conflict for granted, uh, thinking that you know it's, it's so old that it can stay. Uh, it, it will come back and pop up again and again if you don't if you don't face it and find a sustainable solution for that. But I, the lesson I would I would draw from from that is more than on the internal divisions of Europe, um, which on Syria were not that evident. I would say uh, there were there were more evident divisions in the Arab world on Syria, definitely so, um, as well as on Libya. Uh, we Europeans always tend to focus on our own divisions, but I have to say the Arab world has been much more divided than the Europeans on these two conflicts, and that has been quite dramatic. Uh, but more than that, uh, on the Syria conflict, what has been uh, an impediment has been the lack of alignment at a certain, from a certain moment onwards uh, in, in the international community. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now seriously running out of track. Um, but I can't help reacting to two things you said. First, you've alluded to, I think both of you actually, to the importance of bringing all the instruments to bear, you know, economic as well as political and security and people to people and so on. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more, uh, but of course that is enormously uh, difficult. Uh, but the second is, you know, the lack of attention being accorded to uh, these dramas. and. You know, my institute happens to be involved in a dozen or so, and I think everybody feels they've been forgotten. Absolutely everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Syria, everybody feels they've been forgotten by the international community. And to a certain degree, you know, there's something to that, because I think in the last 18 months, partly related to COVID, um, people have become more introspective and have become more focused on uh, domestic um, priorities. I think politicians understandably have prioritized those, but why that is worrisome is that what tends to punch through is not the importance of solidarity, but things like, you know, terrible security crises or flows of, of or, you know, uh, dr you know, terrible tragedies of, of, of um, economic migrants or asylum seekers or, or, or terrorist attacks. And it's as if we're dumbing down in terms of our understanding and engagement uh, with many of these conflicts because we're becoming more absorbed. But Zara, you know, what, what, what's your response to the question? And forgive me, you only have about 90 seconds to do it. To yeah. the idea that diversity yeah. should include talking to people you don't well, like. This is only this question, but I want to say just one thing. We need to understand that the multilateral system uh, today is in crisis and we need to reimagine multilateralism and it's not enough that we say that uh, uh, we, uh, we focus on economic interests no I, I think I think we need to uh, and then uh, say in other issues that we don't have a political leverage this is what we have been seeing from the EU uh, in the Libyan co uh, conflict. So we need uh, not to work in silos and we need to have a more comprehensive integrated approach, not to say, okay, let's work with municipalities, with women, but then when it comes to politi supporting political processes and peace processes, we forget about communities, women, youth, and that clearly makes all these issues, uh, the rights issue only a lip service. 
So uh, putting at the center, it, uh, it means also that we believe really in multi-trackism, that we need to institutionalize it, think of a mechanism how to link everything and not work in silos. I think that's important. What we have been seeing in Libya, uh, we did not see a unified foreign policy of the EU. We've seen two countries in particular, uh, France and Italy, uh, uh, meddling in uh, Libyan uh, uh, affairs and uh, supporting certain factions uh, in violation of the arms embargo. So that's really something major that we need to see. Unfortunately, the EU is not the EU that has inspired Hume long ago. And that's why we need, uh, and it, it has nothing to do with the new Trump, uh, with Trumpism. It's more than that. We need to face it with the rise of populism. Uh, uh, these issues, that's why we need to have a more uh, open uh, discussion that allows for reimagining multilateralism. And just to end uh, your question, uh, yes, we need to respect diversity, but our institutions need to uphold uh, uh, human rights. And that's not something to uh, have a compromise on. So those who are violent extremists, we need to address them and know how to uh, respect the others. But everyone is included. This is how I understand Hume's legacy today. Thank you. Uh, we really have run out of time. Federica, do you want 30 seconds to respond to that? Or should we ask for another session of the next John and Pat Hume conference next year and we can continue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't want to delay the next session that I know is also exciting. Uh, a separate discussion on Libya uh, might be uh, indeed uh, relevant and hopefully for next year uh, in a different position because indeed what Zara said about how things are going today in Geneva is not encouraging. So uh, definitely I will not take more of, uh, of uh, our viewers time and especially out of respect for the next session. I would stop it here. Well, can I just thank you both uh, so much for being so uh, forthcoming and frank and thank again the organizers for giving me this privilege. Uh, I have to say that empathy is one thing, uh, understanding people's perspectives without necessarily subscribing to their values uh, is important. It's really, empathy is extremely important, but not, not necessarily subscription to what they think. On, on that note, thank you. Thanks to the organizers. Our time is out. Very grateful to you. And thank you for those of you who've asked questions. Uh, I hope I didn't miss any. Take care, everyone. Looking forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Julia. Thank you.
As chair of the John and Pat Hume Foundation, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Ireland's Foreign Affairs Minister, Simon Coveney, who will speak to us in a specially recorded message as a final guest of the conference. Minister Coveney has served in the Irish Parliament for the Cork South Central constituency since 1998 and has served as minister in a variety of portfolios before taking on his current role in 2020. He is also deputy leader of his political party, Fine Gael. As minister, he has particular responsibility for relationships with Northern Ireland. And currently, of course, that means having to oversee the, the rather tortuous negotiations that have followed from Brexit as these affect those relationships. He also heads Ireland's delegation at the UN, where the country is currently a member of the Security Council. And there, Ireland is using its influence to help resolve conflict in some of the world's biggest uh, flashpoints, using, to some extent, the approach that John Hume would have used, an approach which includes inclusive approaches, inclusive inclusivity of the political parties involved in those flashpoint areas. I now introduce Simon Coveney and invite the message to be relayed to us. Good afternoon. I'm honoured to address this inaugural European conference organised by the Hume Foundation on the theme of leadership for peaceful change. You've heard over the last two days from a broad range of leaders drawn from, drawn from across our continent who share the vision for a peaceful, inclusive society that shaped John and Pat Hume's work over many, many years. I'd like to congratulate the Foundation for convening this event and for its impressive program of events and dialogue over the last number of months. Many of you will recall John Hume's remarks to the European Parliament following the Good Friday Peace Agreement when he told the gathering of MEPs that the peace process in Northern Ireland has been most heavily inspired by the example of this House. Let's not forget that the European Union is the best example in the history of the world of conflict resolution. This is a view that I share Peace has been at the heart of the European integration process since its inception. We've witnessed at first hand the role the EU has played supporting peace in Northern Ireland through the long process, from creating an environment conducive to dialogue and ultimately a peace agreement, to providing tangible support for reconciliation on our island. We know too that peace building is a key priority in the EU's approach to external conflicts. The EU recognizes that in order to be successful, peace processes must be inclusive and representative of the diversity of society. This was the experience in Northern Ireland too, where women had to struggle to secure representation around the negotiating table, but then had a transformative impact on shaping a final agreement. It's therefore critical that the barriers to women's participation in peace and security matters are addressed thoroughly, including through the implementation of the EU Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Across the world, from the streets of Belarus to Myanmar, women are asserting their right to political participation and activism. The EU must ensure that the peace processes it leads or supports facilitate the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women from the outset. More broadly, the EU has a vital role to play in supporting grassroots and community actors and in amplifying the voices of all sections of society. We've seen the very real benefits that this support for grassroots and community actors has had for people across the island of Ireland over many years because we know from experience that peace is ultimately made by people, by
by courageous politicians like Nobel laureates John Hume and David Trimble, but also activists like Monica McWilliams and Pearl Sager, who crossed sectarian lines to create a better future for the wider community. <clears throat> when receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, John Hume spoke of the new Europe that has evolved and is still evolving based on agreement and respect for difference. He spoke too of how a determination for peace became a shared bond that brought together people of all political persuasions in Northern Ireland and throughout the island of Ireland. Almost 25 years on, Europe is still evolving. Europe faces new and ongoing challenges at home within its neighborhood and globally. As Europe works to resolve these challenges, I am confident that we will continue to be bound together by our collective determination to build inclusive societies through peaceful change, a determination which has been the hallmark of the European Union since its foundation and was embodied in the lives and work of John and Pat Hume. We know that the work of real and sustained peace is the work of generations. And although the work of peace and reconciliation continues in Northern Ireland, we sadly lost John Hume last year. But his legacy and the Good Friday Agreement he helped to shape ensured that a generation has been born and come to adulthood free from the shadow of conflict, fear, and violence. Young people across the island of Ireland continue to be inspired by his vision, a vision that was, as we have been discussing, a fundamentally European one. He believed in a Europe brought together in peace, and he believed in Europe as a force for peace in the world. I can't think of a better way to honor his memory than supporting the practical and generous realization of those ideals into the future. Thank you very much. I thank uh, Minister Coveney for those words, which assure us that uh, John Hume's influence continues and continues to shape uh, the approach of your government. Um, in addressing issues in Northern Ireland, and indeed in addressing, as I said earlier, through the Security Council, uh, issues um, of conflict around the world. As our conference uh, draws to a close, and before I express thanks to the many who have helped organize it, I wish briefly uh, to offer some reflections on our discussions. From the outset, when we considered Europe's formative influence on John Hume's political outlook through until we discussed Europe's role in helping to resolve present day conflicts on its borders and elsewhere. Our discussions have reminded us of the vision and the goals of the founders of this great union. We've been reminded in particular that the EU played a key role in assisting conflict resolution in Northern Ireland and of John Hume's role in shaping that assistance. Today, the role of the EU in helping to shape a peaceful resolution in countries like Belarus and the Balkans and North Africa has provided the conference with further practical examples of what the European Union can do. The vision of a European Union founded on democratic cooperation and working through agreed institutions for the mutual benefit of its peoples must continue to inspire its leaders 70 years after its founders first tentative steps. This is particularly crucial as we experience and address the effects of Brexit, the growing influence of illiberalism, exclusive and authoritarian politics both within and without the EU. Our discussion of Brexit reminds us that as we deeply regret the UK's decision to exit the EU, we must work to refresh, to refresh our own commitment to our founders' vision and strive to strengthen our commitments to the democratic principles and values of our founders. Our resolve to maintain and develop that commitment 
is being severely tested by the challenges of climate change as we deal with the root causes of migration and as we work with governments to ensure viable and meaningful livelihoods for communities in Africa and the Middle East. As John Hume constantly demonstrated, the EU is not and should never be seen as an elite club where only the better off benefit. So while we work to assist conflict resolution outside the EU, we must ensure that the inequalities and disadvantages experienced still within the Union are effectively addressed and that our democratic credentials provide all our citizens with opportunities to make their voices heard on how these problems can be addressed. So as we reflect on our deliberations, there are multiple messages to be taken from this conference. The first of many, which the John and Pat Hume uh, Foundation hopes to organize under the leadership of, of Leadership for Peaceful Change. I now want uh, to express thanks uh, to those who have assisted us in making this conference the success it has been. I begin by expressing thanks to all our speakers and moderators. To them, I wish to add our thanks to our partners at the Robert Schumann Center, Professor Bridget Laffin, Monique Calavari, and Matthias Godzellman, and their technical team. Professor Laffin is retiring from her role as director of the Schumann Center, a role that she has fulfilled with great distinction and we wish her long life and happiness in her retirement. The foundation also thanks our own team at the Hume, at board members, Hugh Logue, Mary McIver and Jerry Cosgrove, advisory council members, Rory Montgomery, and in particular, Michael Doyle for his advice and his meticulous attention to the construction of the conference program. We thank our indefatigable Secretary Tim Atwood, who has worked long hours on the details of the conference. We also express thanks to Enda McNulty for his assistance and the use of his facilities. We thank Brian O'Neill for invaluable technical advice. Last but not least, we are very grateful to you who have joined us, whether for all or for part of the program. Obviously, without an audience, there would have been no conference. Finally, I wish to give you early notice of an event being organized by another associate of the foundation, the Irish Association for Contemporary European Studies. The title for the event is Relationships on These Islands, the European Union Peacebuilding Experience. It will be held virtually on Friday, the 10th of September. More details are available on the association's website. With those words, can I wish you all a very pleasant weekend and look forward to your presence at future events of the foundation. the gas yard wall and we laughed through the smoke and the smell going home in the rain running up the dark lane past the jail and down behind the fountain those were happy days in so many many ways in the town I loved so well 
in the early morning The shirt factory horn Called women from Craigan The moor and the bog While the man and the dog Played a mother's rug Fed the children And then walked the dog And when times got tough, there was just about enough. But they saw it through without complaining. For deep inside was a burning pride in the town I loved so well. There was me. Music there in the dairy air, like a language that we all could understand. I remember the day that I earned my first pay when I played in a small pickup band. There I spent my youth And to tell you the truth I was sad To leave it all behind me For I'd learned about life And I'd found a wife In the town I loved so well But when I've returned, how my eyes have burned To see how a town could be brought to its knees By the armored cars and the bombed out bars And the gas that hangs on to every breeze Now an army's installed by that old gas yard wall And the damn barbed wire gets higher and higher With their tanks and their guns Oh my God, what have they done to the town I loved so well? It's gone, but they carry on, for their spirit's been bruised, never broken. They will not forget, but their hearts are set on tomorrow and peace once again. For what's done is done. What's won is won, and what's lost is lost and gone forever. I can only pray for a bright, brand new day in the town I love so well. Thank you.